everyone, and welcome to Through Time and Clades. My name is Joan. And I'm Albert. And welcome back to our series on Human Origins, Humanity, a Prologue. This is part 10, Settling Down, and it concerns post-Ice Age foragers. But before we jump into our program, Albert, how have things been on your end? Ah, uh, well, um, I'm still very busy. Um... Maybe not quite as much as last week, but uh, still plenty of things on my plate. So, uh, yeah, things have, haven't really lessened all that much for me. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty glad it's at the end of the week. I, I did get some of those things cleared off my to-do list. And, uh, um, yeah, it's uh, it's been a real whirlwind. But uh, I'm, you know, glad to be here and uh, doing the show with you. <laughs> awesome. And likewise. Yeah, I mean, not too much to report on my end. I mean, besides working on the show... Um... Uh, Earth Day, as of today's recording, was yesterday, so I, I spent most of the day watching you know, environmental-themed programs about you know the various issues of our time, mm -hmm. anywhere from extinction to plastics to wildfires, um, and it was my opportunity to finally sit down and watch David Attenborough's A Perfect Planet. Yeah, lovely. Which was a surprise find. I was grocery shopping, and I, you know I, I like to kind of look at the DVD section just to kind of see because sometimes they put those those series on there and i'm like mm -hmm. oh, i'd love to have a set of them so i can watch them whenever and that was there and i'm like well i guess this is happening so i went and got it and i watched all five of the episodes and i mean as far as these you know newer bbc earth documentaries go i was very impressed i mean the the wildlife photography was amazing as always mm -hmm. uh, the, the species coverage was always a treat um they actually did not go too overboard with the familiar animals that we see in a lot of these shows you right know, it wasn't all african wildlife or, <laughs> or great whales or anything like that mm -hmm. i mean we spent a lot of time with insects and with um reptiles and amphibians and so forth yeah. and it was really neat how even though they did not spend too much time and you had mentioned this in our discussions mm -hmm. they didn't spend too much time on like the actual physical aspects of a lot of these processes mm -hmm. each episode talks about you know a phenomenon of the earth that helps sustain life be that you know volcanoes or ocean currents or weather patterns um so yeah, this was not like you know the living planet too <laughs> but i still felt that they did incorporate very well the interactions between living organisms and these processes mm. so like you know volcanoes creating a landscape which organisms live and, and flourish in or weather patterns affecting the reproductive histories of certain organisms that was really cool yeah and as always i i, I mean i appreciate it whenever these are all tied to current environmental issues i mean every episode makes it clear that for the most part all of these processes are being affected by anthropogenic activities right and, and how the idea of the perfect planet you know like these natural rhythmic cycles that have sustained organisms and their communities for thousands of years are now shifting to something different than what's being used to. And the underlying causes of all of that is anthropogenic factors, the most notably the warming of the climate due to, you know, green gas or, or, or um, uh, carbon emissions. And so, of course, the last episode was about this particular topic and took a very wide turn by focusing more on people on the ground. Mm. You know, they brought experts in as talking heads and Attenborough shows up himself and they go through you know the, the the general state of affairs, and I thought that was generally very nice. Um, I I think it's good that these documentaries are taking more of a direct approach to like addressing these issues more and more right. as they're made. Um, I remember uh, Ed Young, a famous journalist researcher. Mm. You know, he made it a point when Planet Earth Two came out. You know, the the first of this new era of documentaries, basically. Mm -hmm. And how his big criticism was that that was not really the case. You know, they were still presenting these wild places as, you know, wild places. And then they'd like only save to the very end, maybe something about, you know, human, uh, human activities. Right, right. That kind of gave some bad impressions. So now that they're like just going straight into it and, and, you know, being very clear, like, oh, by the way, this is changing because of, you know, the change in climate that's caused by human activity. Yeah. I, I definitely appreciate that a lot more, and I hope it helps cement this issue more and more in new viewers' minds who maybe don't 
uh, know a lot about this or aren't that, that well versed with the state of the research at the moment. Mm -hmm. So I appreciated that quite a bit. Uh, so uh, I guess if I could be arbitrary, I'd give it a I'd give it a five out of five. <laughs> yeah, I definitely agree on on that front. Um, it, it was a it was a criticism I saw like somewhat often regarding the uh, recent um, you know big name nature documentaries and you know I, I think it's a it's a valid criticism I mean I, I love those shows but um, de definitely the kind of um, greater focus on uh, the the impact of human activity as well as just the fact that humans are kind of you know integrated into these natural environments like there you know there there really isn't much of a thing of you know pristine wilderness on earth anymore it's uh, it's all very much a human influenced um and yeah i i think uh i think definitely a lot of the recent series including a perfect planet have definitely um, been improving on this and uh, doing a better job of showcasing this aspect of things of the state of affairs and so yeah i i would agree that uh, it is really nice to see that yeah, absolutely. And you're very right. Um, we're going to explore a lot in these final episodes, you know, the roles of humanity in the natural world and kind of break apart a lot of these myths about wilderness and so forth mm -hmm. and, and just how how the state of affairs today got to where it is. So uh, I definitely am, am looking forward to bringing that information to all of you. Um so yeah, I mean, when, when we last left our narrative, Homo sapiens had successfully settled on all of the major continents of the Earth, mm -hmm. except Antarctica, of course. You know, from the from the tip of southern Africa to the farthest fringes of the Solomon Islands and Tierra del Fuego. You know, our species had gained one of the widest distributions of any known mammal, um, at least any known large mammal. Um, the last of these movements coincided with the last glacial maximum. Uh, that's the time during the Pleistocene Ice Ages when the ice sheets had reached their largest spread. Mm -hmm. Big chunks of northern North America and Europe, and to a lesser extent Siberia, were encased in mile-high glaciers. And the world was much cooler and drier than it is today. And most of us, so far as we can tell, were nomadic foragers. However, all of this would eventually come to a close, and soon many different communities of humanity would undergo a process of sedentism and eventually develop the first agricultural societies. Mm. Uh, before we get into those parts of the story, it, it will do us good to kind of see how our species and the environment as a whole responded to the end of the last glacial maximum. So let's dive into the next slide. Right. This process began around 20 to 19,000 years ago, as the Earth's orbit began to change as a result of the usual Milankovitch cycles that played their role in the Pleistocene Ice Ages. The temperature quickly began to rise, and there was a gradual decline in ice sheet cover in the northern hemisphere. This loss of ice usually took the form of meltwater leakage at the bases of the glaciers, followed by complete breakage. Uh, in the North Atlantic in particular, by 16,000 years ago, many glacier chunks found themselves floating into the ocean. This is a process that's known as a Heinrich event, after the marine geologist Hartmut Heinrich, who first described this process. In the overall chronology recognized by climate researchers, it's called Heinrich event one, because although it was the last such event of this type throughout the Pleistocene, when you go backwards in time through North Atlantic marine sediment cores, this is the one that shows up first. Mm. So it gets, you know, it gets first pickings. <laughs> um, simultaneously, meltwater from the Southern Ocean off Antarctica's glaciers began to tinker a bit with the North Atlantic current, you know, turning it back on after its Ice Age hiatus. And this allowed it to bring heat from the warmer equatorial regions up into the North Atlantic, you know, further heating the ocean and thus the climate. The two are, are linked together, of course. Now, you know, this combined with this warming brought the planet into the bowling Allura interstadial by 14.7 thousand years ago. 
Uh, these two names stem from sites in Denmark, hence their, hence, you know, their type, um, where you know, sedimentary studies have revealed you know, this change of past climate. In general, the trend was a warmer climate around the world for about 1800 years, but it was an unequal trend because the continuous melting of glacial freshwater into the oceans often tampered with the North Atlantic current at times. Mm. Uh, sometimes the climate would get cold for a little bit before resuming warming, only to cool and then warm again. Um, so you can kind of see this here on the graph at the right. Um, but you know, whatever cooling occurred was never on the level of the previous ice age. And many parts of the world still managed to change dramatically in terms of their environment. Uh, so before we cover each of the different continents, uh, Albert, is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, no, not especially. Okay. Well, then let's go to the next slide now. Now, we very briefly covered parts of Africa's history during this time in episode eight, because it was towards the end of the last glacial maximum and beyond that the various societies across the continent made their near full transition towards the later Stone Age, which you may recall is the change in tool technologies towards greater complexity and the incorporation of microliths. Now, if there was anywhere on Earth that really felt the effects of the warming climate, it was here. Hmm. Because almost immediately after the start of the bowling Alira interstadial, that Africa's humid period began around 14.6 thousand years ago. Hmm. The orbital changes and the warming climate both drove the West African summer monsoon towards greater strength and rainfall. And this was not a total change towards warmer or more vegetated conditions throughout the whole continent. Um, the evidence seems to suggest that South, Southern Africa was exempt from this process. But the effects were still you know, very remarkable. I mean, in Northern Africa, for example, the Sahara Desert ceased to be a desert. <laughs> right. um, the, the increased rainfall and warmer weather promoted the spread of grasslands and forests northwards. And you know, these vast wetlands were supported, including many river systems and a few of these paleo lakes, uh, including Mega Chad, which was significantly larger than Lake Chad today. Now, fossils and rock art by Saharan communities demonstrate that this green Sahara, that is often called, was home to all sorts of iconic African megafauna. Mm. You know, Sahara was supporting hippos and giraffes and elephants and lions and a whole host of other creatures like turtles and aquatic birds. And contact between human communities was established yet again between mm. Southwest Asia and North Africa. And the results of this contact may likely correspond to the emergence of the Ibero-Marusian toolkit in the Maghreb region that we had previously discussed in episode eight. Now, on the opposite side of the Sahara, along the ever-fertile Nile Valley, the archaeological record becomes much better. And we can see how some communities came to specialize on the riverine resources and became ever more settled down. And this rise in sedentism seems to have spurred conflicts on occasion. Uh, you all may remember our discussion of the site of Jebel Shahaba, where 14,000 years ago, a cemetery was constructed of war casualties with uh, of various ages that had been struck with stone points and killed. Now, these people belonged to the Kadad culture of the upland parts of the Nile, and they had already begun to intensively harvest wild grains. Now, in Western and Central Africa, they represent another unique exception to the changes brought about at the start of the African humid period. Uh, here was the home of some of the last communities to use the Middle Stone Age toolkits, and they were sparsely continuing the practice in the Western regions until about 11,000 years ago, so into the Holocene. Now, some researchers have speculated as to why this is. They point to the aforementioned Iro Iliru skulls as a possible explanation. You may remember that we talked about these. Uh, the skulls share a lot of features with earlier African Middle Pleistocene humans than they do with later Homo sapiens populations. And these might be the result of interbreeding with another human species, who these individuals might have been the makers 
of these late surviving Middle Stone Age tools. Hmm. Now, time will tell if this hypothesis holds up. In the meantime, the warming climate did allow for the massive spread of tropical forests starting 15,000 years ago. And these are representative of the Congo Basin, as well as the western coasts. The Central African forager populations had already begun to split starting 18,000 years ago. And so this expansion of forests would have led to the expansions of these populations too. The appearance of some very beautiful geometric rock art marks the beginning of the Bachua cultural complex, which enjoyed a widespread across the Congo Basin. Now in Eastern Africa, at about the same time, we find the emergence of a new microlithic technology that was developed by peoples who were ancestral to the Hatsube and the Sundawe that we also talked about in the episode eight. The spread of wider savannas and the greater abundance of game animals was a likely driver of this new toolkit, which would have been used in part for the tipping of bow and arrows. Now further to the north, from present-day Kenya and Tanzania towards the Horn of Africa, we find what might be a significant event in the history of human languages. A hypothesis that has been promoted by Christopher Errett, who is a noted scholar of African linguistics, is that the Horn of Africa was the original homeland, or Orheimat, of the Afroasiatic language family. And this belongs to one of the four major language families of mainland Africa, and it's the only one to have expanded into Eurasia in prehistoric times. Wow. Now, Eret's hypothesis is based on the overall classification of the various languages within this family. Uh, Amoric, followed by Cushitic, are the oldest diverging tongues and are primarily found across this part of the world and they've been suggested to have emerged between 24 and 17,000 years ago, based on glottochronology. Now, as you move further in time through the Afroasiatic language tree, do you see the gradual divergence of Chadic, Egyptian, um, the Proto-Berber, and uh, Semitic? And the Semitic language family includes, of course, Hebrew and Aramaic and Arabic. So you can actually trace this language family as it emerges from the Horn of Africa and northwards along the Nile and then into Southwest Asia. Now, it's certainly a fascinating hypothesis. I mean, I mean, linguistic anthropology is no stranger to discourse. Mm -hmm. Of course, others have proposed other ideas for the origin and subsequent history of Afro-Asiatic. Um, although this one seems to have been gaining more and more support. But of course, regardless of what hypothesis is proposed, I mean, the, the widespread distribution of this particular language family across two continents only further demonstrates the types of conditions that allowed human communities in the first place to move so easily across the Red Sea. And as I mentioned already, Southern Africa does not appear to have been affected much by the Bioling Alarad Interstadial, and communities could be found settling in coastal cave sites like Nelson's Bay Cave, which much of that has already been discussed in episode eight. So. Let's jump to the next slide now. Okay. And we're gonna enter Eurasia mm -hmm. on the westward side. We can see other instances of the sorts of dramatic climate and cultural changes that affected the world after the last glacial maximum. In general, the steppe tundra common in the far north was replaced by temperate forest or forest steppe, which is of more of a kind of like an open woodland, if you will. Mm -hmm. In Southwest Asia, during the LGM, uh, many of the ecological communities were restricted to various refugia, particularly in the highland regions like the Zagros Mountains or parts of the Levant. These are the so-called hilly flanks. You see in the map here, they're in orange. Uh, as temperatures warmed and the arid deserts shrunk back, these regions expanded outwards across the landscape, and in particular across a curved band of land famously known as the Fertile Crescent, which I show here in green. Now, among many of these plants were oaks and cereals, which proved to be excellent sources of food for human beings. Uh, conditions supported larger populations, and many societies gradually turned towards sedentism. And one of the earliest known of these sites is Ohalo II in present-day Israel, which emerged during the very end of the LGM, so about 23,000 years ago. I mean, this is a remarkable site. 
uh, you have a small series of brush and wood dwellings by a lakeside that was eventually burned down. Now, maybe this was due to a, an unfortunate campfire accident or something else. Um, it's been proposed that maybe to help remove pest species that were infesting people, they just kind of burned down all the houses and, and moved somewhere else. Mm. Um, but soon after the fire, no matter how it was caused, uh, and this comes from the sedimentology analysis, a flood covered these destroyed homes and then preserved the site until 1989 when a local drought brought the water levels down just enough for archaeologists to discover these remains in the first place. Now, Ohalo 2 is one of those sites that represents a very long but direct link in the archaeological record to the emergence of agricultural societies in the Fertile Crescent. Because researchers have shown that the people who camped here not only harvested wild grasses, like barley and wheat, but they ground them down with stone and baked them into an edible dough. Now, as far as we can tell, no other Southwest Asian sites this far back in time show this activity. As the years rolled on following the LGM, more and more nomadic forager communities were experimenting with plants like this. And soon many of these nomadic societies turned to sedentism. They were staying for longer and longer and intensifying their use of plant foods. And this culminated in the emergence of sites like Tel Abu Herrera in Syria. This is a 13.5 thousand year old village that systematically hunted gazelles and gathered over 200 species of plants and then stored all of these in storage containers for the cooler months. Now evidence suggests that sites like these had grown large enough to facilitate trade networks. You know, as early as 16,000 years ago, there were communities that were trading obsidian and other materials between Anatolia and Levant. So that's you know quite a lot of kilometers of distance. Now, one of these early cultures was the Kabaran of the Levant, who were active between 18 and 15,000 years ago. Now, while they did not harvest grains as much as the other cultures of the time, and their societies consisted only of small nomadic bands, they are important in that they represent the direct ancestors of the famous Natufians, who we'll meet in a moment. Meanwhile, in Europe, the deglaciation of the northern regions permitted foragers to expand back into the British Isles and other neighboring parts. So emerging from the declining Salutrian culture were the Magdalenians, who coexisted with the Epigravedians as the two expanded northwards from the Mediterranean. They represent the last of the in-situ forager societies in Europe hmm. before the warring of the bowling alley rod in the stadial allowed new foragers from Southwest Asia to expand their populations into the peninsula. And this combined ancestry was essentially set the genetic stage, at least, for Europe's foragers into later times. So, okay, just what were these Magdalenians like? Well, if we jump to the next slide... Mm -hmm. As is the tradition in archaeological cultures, the Magdalenian owes its name to the site where their technology was first recognized. That is the rock shelter of La Madeleine in France. Now, these foragers represent a bit of a renaissance in terms of European forager societies, because with all the new technology and all the new territory that reemerged from under the glaciers, not only did their population size increase, but the sort of semi-sedentism that the Gravettians were known for seems to have reappeared too. Technology-wise, they, you know, they were continued uses. So the sewing needles and the burins that were seen in earlier sites had continued their presence. Um, and, but there were inventions as well. So far as we can tell, the atolotl, or the spear thrower, in Europe at least, uh, either developed from the Magdalenians or its use increased under them. Hmm. They were going after a number of prey animals, but the most common of these seems to have been the reindeer. Mm. Many of these tools made by these people actually were crafted out of antler and bone from these animals. And as the topmost image shows, I mean, one of, the, one of these iconic tools from the Magdalenians were these barbed harpoons, which would have made powerful weapons for spearing fish. Now, many of the large rock shelters and the wood and hide dwellings unearthed at various sites indicate that, you know, there's evidence that there were more sedentary lifestyles occurring among these peoples. 
you know, there were hundreds of smoked and dried salmon that were stored for later periods of time. And there were objects that were buried in pits as well for later use. But if we go to the next slide, mm -hmm. one of the biggest stars of the bowling alley rod in stadial or the Natufians of the Levant. And they lived between 14.5 and 11.5 thousand years ago. You know, they have been heavily studied by archaeologists, you know, often at the expense that you know, other neighboring cultures at the time still haven't received similar treatment. Um, still, the Natufians offer a fascinating window into the relationships between culture and environment that have played such a strong part in the human story, especially following the last glacial maximum. So ancient DNA analysis has indicated connections with these peoples, as well as communities as far as the ibero marusians of Northwest Africa, the Cushitic speaking peoples of Africa's Rift Valley, and the predecessors of the ancient Egyptians. And this is highlighted in the fact that human connections between North Africa and Southwest Asia were strong around this time, as I previously stated. And they kind of allowed for this exchange in genes as well as technologies and perhaps languages. So, I mean, I just discussed the origin and spread of Afro-Asiatic languages. According to Christopher Eretz's model, you know, the speakers of these languages seem to have spread northwards from the Horn of Africa across the Nile Valley and into the Levant. And uh, why chromosomal studies have added support for this. Hmm. So there would have been about, there seems to have been like a fairly small number of people that was involved in these particular expansions, but enough to at least affect things on a cultural level. So the uh, the timing suggests that the Natufians may have spoken the ancestral Proto-Semitic language, which eventually developed into Semitic proper following the rise of agriculture in the region. Hmm. Uh, the other peoples across North Africa at the same time began to incorporate you know, this sort of Proto-Berber, Proto-Egyptian, and Proto-Kushite languages into their lives. Now, in the beginning, the Natufians were very much like the Kabarans who preceded them. They were nomadic foragers who originally did not specialize on any one food. They hunted gazelles, deer, and pigs, and they gathered fruits, seeds, and grasses. Now, the general productivity of the Levant seems to have encouraged a rise in overall population. And eventually, we see evidence of Natufian communities settling down and becoming more sedentary. They still foraged, but this time they began to intensify their collection of five species in particular. Gazelles, pistachios, acorns, wheat, and barley, hmm. and which were soon being stored for future consumption rather than eaten the same day. And over time, their settlements grew into villages, and their intensification of food collection was supplemented by new technologies. So these included pestles and mortars for grinding seeds and turning them into a type of bread, as well as incidentally the, the first types of beer by 13,000 years ago, uh, and carved bone sickles, which sharp microlithic stones were fastened onto their edges. So you can see them in the image above, this kind of reconstruction. It had a very sharp edge and they could take care of the stalks that were needed. Now the villages themselves were impressive. I mean, some of these spanned 700 square meters or more in area. Um, one such site is Ein Malaha in present-day Israel, where the characteristic Natufian house was a semi-sedentary dwelling built of stone walls and thatched roofs of grass and animal hide. While food processing was done in the same places people slept, there were also separate buildings for storage alone. So the image below shows the smaller storage house on the right next to the larger home dwelling where you can kind of see evidence of some of these mortars and pistols and so forth. Um, but it must be stressed, however, that there is no evidence that the Natufians were engaging in agriculture proper. Mm -hmm. you know, the, there's no signs of fields or, or plots along the houses. Um, it seems what was going on was that these people were deliberately changing their local environment to support the types of food that they valued most. You know, wild gardens, if you will. Um, but none of the food crops appear to have undergone domestication, much less selective breeding. Still, you know, this is generally what archaeologists have found in the stages leading towards domestic crops and eventual agriculture. 
However, there was a slight change of pace, uh, as I will explain more after our sort of global survey here. Uh, the advent of the Younger Dryas period caused a recooling of the Earth's climate, which effectively ended the Natufian culture in the Levant. Hmm. Sedentary villages ceased to be constructed, and the people reverted back to nomadic ways. Now, the practices of intensive cultivation did not vanish. So we have evidence that shows that the Natufians actually continued to actively harvest select crop species. But what they would do this time was carry the seeds with them wherever they went. So, you know, there they could plant seeds in certain locations and then leave them to grow over the following year. So that when the people returned to set up camp, there was food already there. And so, yeah, when the, when the Younger Dryas ended, the descendants of the Tufians would thus still have this harvesting knowledge. Albert, would, do you have anything you'd like to add to what I've covered so far? Well, I, I think this period is uh, rather, at least from you know what little I've seen and read, a uh, rather underappreciated kind of uh, point of um, you know human history. Um, it, but you know, from what you're saying here, it definitely seems to, in hindsight, really set the stage for a lot of later human developments and with great um, influence on how we currently live. So I think it is really fascinating. Yeah, I um, I think as far as eras of human prehistory, this is probably one of my favorites. <laughs> um, they still called after the ice period, right? I mean, just just because I mean, yeah, like it, it is very foundational. I mean. I, I like to think that in historical circles, if we want to understand, you know, human development over time, there has to be an emphasis on prehistory. Mm -hmm. and this period following the end of the last ice age, but prior to the agricultural societies is, is key to our understanding. So, yeah, I'm glad you think so. So uh, let's go ahead and continue on the next slide now. Mm -hmm. Now, moving to the east of Eurasia, we find no less exciting changes. Here especially, the rise of sedentary societies was widespread as the environment warmed. Now, South Asia's record out of the entire region is still quite poor at the time. Hmm. I mean, the most we can say is that humans continued to enjoy a relatively stable and diverse ecosystem of forests and grasslands, where they mostly resided in caves as well as open air sites. Um, the only site worth mentioning is that of Kurul Nul Caves on the Eastern Ghats, where a few stone tools and a, a limestone hearth surrounded by burnt animal bones is all that we can tell of human activity in the late Pleistocene of India. So yeah, when, um, when we move to Southeast Asia, you know, we get slightly better sites. Um, most of the region was still encompassed in the landmass known as Sunda, uh, populated mostly by Hoabinian cultures in the lower forests and the shrinking glasslands. There are signs, however, of new human expansions into the region after 15,000 years ago. First, groups with deep ancestral ties to the present-day Manobo peoples entered the southern Philippines, and then some populations ancestral to the Austroasiatic-speaking Sama peoples moved in later on, and they settled widely across Sunda, including the Philippines. Now, much of this particular information was only discovered through genetic research very recently. Um, it was from a March study by uh, Maximilian Lorena and colleagues. And so they kind of add greater clarification to the demographics of this period of time. So uh, moving northward to East Asia, we see an environmental shift as the cool evergreen forests that were common during the last ice age are replaced by the warmer deciduous forests. And many regions that were originally barren hills and mountains became forested too. The various river systems had risen up with glacial meltwater, and wetlands slowly began to appear. So along the southern Yangtze River system, water-loving rice begins to spread from its previous refugial homelands. Mm. All along the northern Huanghe River system, millet grows in the fertile lowest soils that have given the Huanghe its English name of the Yellow River. Mm as these soils basically turn the water yellow, they're, they're so prevalent. Now, in many places following the LGM, East Asian communities gradually develop semi-sedentary and sedentary societies in these warmer environments. 
So there's a Nan Shuang To of the Hubei province around 14,000 years ago that represents one of these sites. Now, by this time, you know, many technological changes had been made. Um, the, the later spread of microlithic technologies from the north by 17,000 years ago is one example of this. Now, the use of pottery picked up pretty fast in East Asia, and the practice can be later traced across a, a wide swath of the region, including the Japanese archipelago. Um, early pottery has been found among the Jomon culture, who emerged around 14.5 thousand years ago. And they too consisted of sedentary societies that made use of abundant resources in the forest, as well as along the coasts. And lastly, Siberia remained a land of mostly nomadic foragers. Um, the ancient North Eurasians still had maintained a strong presence in the interior. Uh, you know, they had, you know, they developed their mammoth hunting up on Tovagora culture between about 23 and 22,000 years ago, for example. But at the end of the LGM, starting 20,000 years ago, demographic shifts began to take place from the southeast. The ancestral component of these incoming peoples is shared with the East Asian populations, as well as the Amerindians. And they begin to actually displace the ancient North Eurasians over much of their range. So by 11,000 years ago, most of Siberia is populated by what are known as Paleo-Siberians. So the ancestors of the Chukchi and the Koryak and the Edelman peoples. So let's jump to the next slide now. Yep. Let's look at Sahul, good old Sahul. <laughs> um, you know, this landmass continued to remain intact after the LGM, um, you know, but it was living on borrowed time as rising sea levels would eventually divide up the lands by about 10,000 years ago. So giving us present day New Guinea, Australia, and Tasmania. Now, indigenous oral traditions remarkably, you know, they often retain memories of the times when the sea levels were lower. So at least going back 10,000 years ago or more, you know, indigenous groups still, you know, retain this knowledge that, oh yeah, I remember when that coral reef was <laughs> connected to the landmass. Right. Right? You know, I remember that island was part of the landmass. You know, that, that's always incredible to, to know. Um, so the changes following the last glacial maximum, so between about 26.5 and 19,000 years ago, were basically marked by intense desertification in Sahul, you know, the, the, the growth of the outback. And uh, this led to a number of pronounced changes among the human communities, including a rise in genetic and cultural regionalization as these different environments changed. So uh, outback populations, for example, actually adapted to the frequent colder nights by reducing their rates of metabolism, which really helps out a lot in those situations. Now, given the genetic evidence for the high levels of continuity in Australia, it is a bit unsurprising that the archeological data shows some technologies that have been continuously produced from very early dates. So, for example, the practice of making stone adze blades has been around for 20,000 years. Um, the creation of stone pendants, so kind of like jewelry, uh, that's been going on for 14,000 years. And the construction of the iconic boomerang very likely goes back a long way, too. So we have like the oldest physical evidence uh, about 12,000 years ago from swamplands that have preserved the, you know, the wooden structure of the boomerang. But when we look at some of the older rock art, we see that you know they were probably making boomerangs since 20,000 years ago, or maybe even older than that. Now, Tasmania was a world apart from the rest of Sahul, you know, e even when it was still connected to the mainland, you know, because you know during that time, the LGM, the peninsula was covered with glaciers and tundra and cool grasslands, you know, even as the rest of the continent grew more and more arid into the end of the LGM. And so the wildlife here was you know, less diverse than on the mainland, but you know, you know, most of the humans who had settled here managed to make a living hunting smaller game like mm -hmm. wallabies. And uh, we see many different cave sites that were common, you know, safe places from the cold. And, and these Tasmanian communities created some very lovely cave art, hand stencils, and they even reworked glass into hunting points. So technically this is called Darwin glass. And people had to travel many tens of kilometers from their cave dwellings to excavate this glass from a meteor crater. So that's pretty fascinating. Um, New Guinea 
remained a region of mostly tropical forest, you know, as the grasslands that had been around during the LGM were giving way to them. But the genetic and archaeological evidence seemed pretty clear that there was little to no contact between indigenous Papuans and the neighboring Aboriginal Australians, and this started around 25,000 years or so. Uh, the people here had been closely reworking the local environment for even longer than that. And especially in the highlands, you know, there was an intense gathering of specific foods. So taro, yam, and bananas, hmm. which has implications for later. Now, the eastern Melanesian islands, so we have the Bismarck Archipelago to the left and the Solomons to the right, had only been recently settled by the end of the LGM. And even as these lands were being populated, contact was still maintained between many of them as people traded foods and materials. So for example, obsidian was a very valued rock that could be worked into tools that gave a sharper edge. And one major source was from the volcanoes of New Britain. And traders would go the whole length of 350 kilometers from New Ireland just to acquire it. Now, a really neat aspect of early life on the islands was that, well, it's the apparent fact that people really seem to like small furry animals. <laughs> um, you can see the image here on the right, the couscous, which is a tree-dwelling marsupial that is related to the Australian possums, mm -hmm. which is different from the American opossums. That's a, that's a whole thing there. Mm -hmm. um, this is known from many sites on the islands, but these islands did not belong to their native range. Right. So humans traveling to and fro from the islands seem to have actually transported these animals with them. And if the ethnographic record had any clues to give, these were being used not only as food, but as pets. <laughs> now, what's interesting is that, you know, this practice of non-agricultural peoples keeping pets is actually fairly widespread. Mm -hmm. I mean, even if we ignore dogs, um, everywhere from Australia to South America, you know, we find cases where people would just take in wild parrots, uh, anteaters, wallabies, turtles. They even go after hawks and tapirs, mm -hmm. and they would raise them as non-food animals. Um, like the couscous in particular, you know, kids would just hold them on their shoulders and just take them around while they would go out and play and, and do stuff. Um you know, th that the case of the couscous has been going on for at least 20,000 years. Well, that tells us that, you know, even if this isn't domestication, you know, pets have been an aspect of our lives for quite some time. Oh, yeah. yeah so that, that's pretty cool, wouldn't you say? Definitely. <laughs> yeah. So uh, let's jump to the next slide now and conclude by looking at the Americas. Mm. Now, as far as the Americas go, you know, we don't have to retread too much ground here. I mean, during the time that all of these previous events that I've talked about were going on, the Americas, and we're following the convention here, were first settled by human beings. You know, the, the ancestors of the Amerindians had established a wide range from north to south by 14,000 years ago. And by then, the Cordilleran and Laurentide ice sheets were receding enough to create an open corridor between them of increasing biological viability. After that, we find evidence of some very large cultural traditions on both continents. So in North America, do we find the famous Clovis complex? Mm. And this existed for between 13.2 and 12.8 thousand years ago. Not a long period of time. Uh, the defining feature of these stone tools are, are the fluted points that were carved for easy attachment onto projectile spears, which you can see here in the bottom left. Now the widespread distribution of these points does remain a source of discourse. I mean, Clovis points have been found from Washington State to Florida, uh, from the Midwest and down into Central America. The only genetic evidence that we have of associated peoples is the sequence recovered from the Anzic child from Montana. And his DNA shows very clear and deep connections to living Amerindians in both North and South America. Hmm. Now, that said, it's unclear just what the relationship is between the peoples and this technological complex. You know, was there a great wave of population expansion in the Americas that just transported these Clovis tools so far and wide? You know, or was networking so great that 
you know, everyone in North America could learn how to make them? Mm-hmm. Or, you know, was there something else going on? Uh, yeah, at the very least, the confirmed presence of sites older than those of the Clovis complex does demonstrate that, as we described previously, the old Clovis first model for the peopling of the Americas is no longer valid. Mm. Now, in South America, a similar circumstance occurred. Uh, there is a widespread post-LGM toolkit that's been called the Fell or Fishtail Complex. And its production was between about 13 and 10,000 years ago. And again, across the continent from Argentina to Venezuela, and even entering Central America a little bit. Now, as you might guess, the name Fishtail comes from the shape of the projectile points. And again, you can see these below. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, in, in a really great example of recycling, you know, fishtail points would be napped at very large sizes at first before being constantly reworked after each use. So they would be resharpened and resharpened again. And so you see this kind of decrease in length over time for a lot of these tools. Wow. It was once thought that the fishtail complex was related to the Clovis complex, but this view has been increasingly rejected by archaeologists. But, you know, the discourse is still the same. You know, what is the nature behind the fishtail complex and its spread? It's a good question. Now, of relevance in a little bit is the fact that both the Clovis and the fishtail technologies were used in the context of big game hunting. A number of sites are known where these tools are associated with megafaunal kills, mm-hmm. including mammoths and mastodons. But the people who made these points were also generalized foragers. And I think that's important to mention. You know, they were also going after small game and plant foods as well, right. as foragers tend to do. Um, Albert, do you have anything you'd like to add? Uh, not particularly. Okay. Well, let's jump to the next slide now. And... Uh, as we see, just when the world was looking to get <laughs> nice and toasty, we get this curveball that's thrown. Yep. So the gradual melting of the North American ice sheets had created a number of paleo lakes, including including uh, Agassiz, uh, which had a size on par with you know all of the Great Lakes combined. You can really see that on the map here that I include. Um, at first, these lakes were confined to the mainland, but with each passing year and each retreating glacier, the meltwater began to drain into the North Atlantic. Now, this had been going on for, you know, quite some time after the LGM, you know, as previously stated, but the incorporated, the incorporation of, you know, these enormous paleo lakes to this process was essentially the straw that broke the camel's back. You know, enough cool fresh water mixed with the oceanic salt water that the North Atlantic warm current, that is the Gulf Stream, shut down again. And, you know, this loss of convection helped to plunge the world back into previous glacial conditions Mm. for at least a very brief time, you know, 1,200 years. But, you know, with this return of freezing temperatures came a very rapid cooling and drying of the world. And so we call this the Younger Dryas. Now, for some context, the name Younger Dryas comes from these little flowers in the image at the left. Uh, this is Dryas octopetala, mm-hmm. or the mountain avens. Basically, these flowers like to grow in tundra conditions. And during the ice ages, they flourished across the northern hemisphere, in the Americas and in Eurasia as well. So when researchers found a spike in Dryas flowers between 12.9 and 11.7 thousand years ago, they dubbed this period of time the Younger Dryas. And I guess, <laughs> just to clarify, yeah, there is an older Dryas mm-hmm. too. Yep, that was mm-hmm. around fourteen thousand years ago. But I mean, this this was a, a a much briefer event that only lasted maybe a few hundred years. Um, so for our narrative purposes, this is not, you know, that's not, not something to worry about too much. But uh, in any case, the younger Dryas was not a great time for anybody. Mm. I mean, droughts ravaged much of the world. And they affected human communities. I mean, our friends, the Natufians, you know, they had to abandon their sedentary lifestyles because of the cooling and drying of their lands. Mm -hmm. And other peoples felt similar effects. And other organisms certainly strongly felt the effects of this as well. And perhaps maybe some more than others. So if we go to the next slide, Mm -hmm. 
Uh, yeah. yeah um, if there has ever been a great discourse <laughs> in the world of prehistoric anything, right? It's this. You know, yeah. what killed the megafauna at the end of the last ice age? To date, there is no consensus to this question, and the two answers that have been variously given are usually either a climate change or b human activity mm -hmm. hunting now both of these responses have their fair share of good points mm -hmm. and poor points mm -hmm. and evidence has been brought forth in support or dismissal of both you know the the latter argument in particular has created a lot of heated argument i mean on the spectrum of responses to the idea that you know our species played you know a major role in wiping out all of these large animals you know it, it it's either you know the greatest lesson about conservation ever mm. and it cements our duty to actively fix our mistakes by rewilding the world oh, with yes. elephants and lions or on the other hand you know it's a nasty racist lie that right. blames indigenous communities for ecological mismanagement where none has occurred right right and you know honestly if this 2018 paper by lisa nagaoka and colleagues has anything to say about it the fact that such discourse is around at all is because there's a major lack of communication between different scientific fields mm -hmm. especially archaeology and ecology mm -hmm. you know ecologists as a rule they tend to single out human-induced extinctions. So mm. this is what we call the, the overkill model of the geologist Paul Martin as the major cause of the megafaunal die-offs, while archaeologists only relegated as part of a number of cases, including climate changes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you know, rather than get into the minutiae of scientific discourse, you know, I'm going to go ahead and lay out the facts and the observations that we have, mm -hmm. and then we're going to look to see what this evidence has to say regarding this. So, for one thing, the megafaunal extinctions cannot be considered a mass extinction event. Right. As defined, a mass extinction event involves multiple biological lineages from across the tree of life. You know, not a small sample of mammals, birds, and reptiles. Um, secondly, you know, they did not all happen at the same time. But you know, across a, a general span of the late Pleistocene and into the Holocene, uh, and thirdly, you know these losses, while they are tragic, certainly, they do not appear to have been as aberrant as far as the Cenozoic extinction rate goes. Mm -hmm. um, there's studies that suggest that this kind of matches what has been observed in earlier epochs. Um, I mean, as is generally the case, you know the large size of megafaunal species works in tandem with specialized ecological niches, and low population sizes with long gestation periods for very little offspring. In other words, megafauna are typically case-selective. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So megafauna are usually always vulnerable to changes. Right. At least mammalian megafauna. Now, what sorts of animals are we talking about? You know, who was lost? Well, to kind of run through the continents, we'll go through the losses in the time that they had occurred. So in Sahul, between 45 and 40,000 years ago, we lost several giant kangaroos, a diprotodon, and the other giant wombat relatives. Um, we have the marsupial lion, a thylacolio. Um, there's a 30 kilogram echidna. Hmm. We have the flightless fowl, Guinea ornus. Mm -hmm. hmm. There's a terrestrial crocodilian, Quincana. There's a giant snake. And then there's the monitor lizard, Baranus priscus. Now, that's a loss of almost all the large animals, yeah. save for you know the red kangaroo and I guess the emu and the cassowaries, too, mm -hmm. and the thylacine, um, mm -hmm. although that one would eventually die off from the Australian mainland around three to 2,000 years ago. Right. And then, of course, died out in Tasmania, uh, I think it's like the 1930s or 40s. Yeah, right. Um, so then across Afro-Eurasia, there were large to marginal losses. So uh, Africa had very gradually lost some of its megafauna within the last few hundred thousand years, uh, mostly a number of cattle and antelope, um, 
There's a giraffe relative, there's a rhinoceros, and an elephant. Um, but for the most part, you know, all this iconic wildlife was spared. Mm -hmm. uh, India's losses, as we've discussed in one of our previous news episodes, they were also equally low. Mm -hmm. So you had two members of the elephant lineage, a horse, a hippo, the native ostriches, and then the ancestor of the domestic zebu cattle. And this is all between about 30 to 10,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, India's megafaunal composition stayed pretty high, including all of its predators. Um, Europe, Siberia, East Asia, and Southeast Asia were much more pronounced. I mean, you have the woolly mammoth mm -hmm. and the woolly rhinoceros. Um, there's the giant deer megaloceros, a giganteus. Uh, you have a few horses and some other rhinos. Uh, there's a giant tapir. Uh, we have some cattle, several hippos, a couple of big cats, uh, some bears and hyenas, elephant species, uh, and then the giant tortoise Megalochelys atlas, mm. which is an amazing animal. Um, and I guess if you want to be technical, there's the Neanderthals and the Denisovans. That's right. And then their relatives, too. Now, the mainland Americas offer a dramatically different picture. Mm -hmm. um, there's a series of extinctions that, you know, until about eleven to 10,000 years ago, were the norm over the end of the LGM. Uh, all of the mammoths and their relatives, uh, there were multiple species of camels, several horses, um, all the ground sloths, and the glyptodonts, these giant armadillos, um, the native South American ungulates, so toxodon and macrochenia. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a few species of bison, the dire wolf, which we talked about previously as well, mm -hmm. uh, the saber-toothed cats, the short-faced bear arctotus, uh, a number of pronghorns, which again are called antelopes, but are not antelopes, mm -hmm. Um, there were many tapers. Um, there was Morassionyx, which is a, a cheetah relative. Mm -hmm. um, the so-called American lion, which is maybe not a true lion like Panthera leo. Um, and the giant beavers. So, uh, what makes the American extinctions so remarkable is that most of the large megafauna we know today in the Americas, or at least in North America, were not contemporaries with these now extinct species. You're right. Uh, evidence suggests that the the brown bear, the moose, and the elk, at least, all entered the Americas at a very late date, mm -hmm. you know, likely along the same routes and at the same time that the first humans took. So within the last 20,000 years or so. Um, and the plains bison, so the famous you know, species in Yellowstone and so forth, they actually only evolved after all the other bison died out around 10.5 thousand years ago so they had adapted to a more generalized diet by changing their gut anatomy to allow for the digestion of winter grasses mm -hmm. which are typically low nutrients and they, they would be usually ignored as as groups moved to and fro on the plains um i mean yeah like so different were the americas just within the last 12,000 years i mean over 70 percent of the megafauna on both continents died out um, and it's when we move from the continents to their neighboring islands, do we mm. see extinctions occurring at later dates within the Holocene? Right. You know, it's, it's, it's a bit out of scope of our focus for this episode, mm -hmm. but they are still significant nonetheless. Um, I mean, there were many losses on the Mediterranean islands, uh, some of which Albert, you had talked about in the last episode that mm. we did on raptors, you know, the, those giant owls and rodents and hedgehogs, um, but there were also, you know, dwarf species of elephants and hippos and deer and goats, too. Um, and there was a giant swan. Hmm. Um, in the Caribbean, I mean, there was a host of strange animals of hmm. notable size that had died out. There were several species of ground sloth, as well as the, the giant hoodias, which hmm. are rodents related to the nutria. Um, a couple species of monkeys and a number of flightless birds. So Xenocybus yep. hmm. and there's the giant owl Ornomegalonyx, you know, both of which, again, Albert, you had talked about previously <laughs> um, and then lastly the islands in the indian ocean including madagascar and the pacific ocean had their extinctions mm -hmm. um, but again you know these occurred much later in the holocene right. well within historical times um so we'll talk about them much later important to note are the loss of the giant lemurs and the elephant bird on madagascar mm -hmm. and of course the moa and Haas eagle of new zealand but these are just some of many losses. So yeah, from this ex exhaustive list, I mean, the megafaunal losses were widespread, and they were across all sorts of ecological niches. Right. Neither herbivores nor carnivores were spared. Mm -hmm. Now, proponents of the overkill model 
have looked at the times and the locations of these extinctions and have stated that there was a strong correlation between the times when humans arrived on a landmass and when the megafauna began to die out. So on the next slide, you can see this chart here. Mm -hmm. This uh, showcases uh, extinction rates for megafaunal species on different continents. So those are the red horizontal lines that you can see here. Uh, the vertical green bars with the little silhouettes there, you know, that, that's the earliest secure dates that we have of human occupation in these places. And these are all charted over a period of 120,000 years. Now, the biggest arguments in favor of the overkill model are as follows. So Homo sapiens evolves in Africa and has had a marked presence on that continent for over 300,000 years. Uh, other human species like Homo erectus and the Neanderthals have been around for much longer than that, and in other parts of the world too, like Europe and Southern Asia. The fact that the losses of megafauna in these parts of the world have not been as severe as they have been on other continents, like Australia and the Americas, suggests that enough time had passed for these large animals to become adapted to a human presence. And now found ways to deal with human hunters that have not led to them, you know, going to its extinction for right. the most part. Um, I mean, the most persuasive evidence for this phenomenon comes from islands, mm -hmm. as I've alluded to before. I mean, the losses of species on island ecosystems like New Zealand or Hawaii or Madagascar, they have been very closely tied to the arrival of humans. Mm -hmm. I mean, as confined as these environments are, the ecological pressures put on megafauna tend to be especially severe. So perhaps the same sort of thing happened on continental scales. Now it's when Homo sapiens began to expand across the world, you know, living in larger communities, using new hunting technologies, that the megafauna began to feel these sorts of population pressures. Now, according to the most conventional model, you know, humans enter North America after 17,000 years ago and began to turn up in greater abundance after 14,000 years ago across both of the continents. It's around that time that we begin to see losses in megafaunal species mm. because the animals have never lived with humans before. So they haven't had enough time to adapt to their hunting strategies. And so one by one, they all began to die out. Now, a number of studies have pushed for the American megafaunal extinctions at least to have been mostly the result of human activity. Mm. But in fact, a paper just came out this month <laughs> that was arguing for a direct correlation between the rise of the fishtail complex and the losses of megafauna in South America. Mm. Now, as I've discussed in the last episode, the situation in Sahul is trickier to understand. Mm -hmm. I mean, we just don't have the sorts of evidence for human megafaunal interactions like we do in the Americas. You know, so it's not responsible really at the moment to speculate too much mm. on that front. Um, but in any case, you know, humans would have found a much better time dealing with herbivores than with carnivores. So the losses of the latter would be the result of their prey animals being killed off. Mm. And, and large megafaunal predators tend to be specialized to large megafaunal prey animals. Right. However, you know, once you unpack all of this discussion, and you look across some of the more global trends, you do find that there are problems with blaming humans on all of the extinctions. Mm -hmm. Now, some of the dates between human occupation and species losses are not as close as they seem. Mm -hmm. um, as new evidence emerges, these connections diminish further. Um, I mean, take, for example, the Americas. You know, if it does turn out to be the case, that humans have been on those land masses for 30,000 years or more, well, that's more than enough time for megafauna to adapt to a hunting presence. I mean, it, it's still unclear whether humans were actually hunting all of these species in the same intensive way. I mean, yeah, humans do tend to kill more animals than they can eat in one setting, but they also tend to shape environments and selectively hunt to ensure that game animals are not depleted. Now, the arguments for climate change playing a role in the megafaunal extinctions tend to come down to the end of the ice ages. So many of these animals were adapted to the cooler conditions of the last ice age. So once things got warmer, their environments changed and they found themselves without food 
or suitable breeding grounds. As mentioned previously, megafauna tend to be specialists, so the loss of even a few key plant foods or prey items can be enough to cause serious problems. And if breeding grounds are lost without these foods, well, then reproduction rates can drop. And, you know, if you're, if you're a case-selected animal, you know, that's never a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, yet many of these species have lived through multiple glacial interglacial periods. Right. So, you know, why would this particular one be any different? Well, that might come down to two things. Even if megafaunal species manage to live across these different environmental changes, that doesn't necessarily mean that survival rates were equal across time. Mm -hmm. One great example of this is the mammoth steppe of Eurasia and North America. This is a, a cool, dry grassland ecosystem where many species, so the namesake mammoths, called it home. You know, these would have flourished during the glacial periods, but then they would have diminished during the interglacials because the warming climate would encourage the spread of forests into those regions. So it wouldn't be a mammoth steppe anymore. Now, many of the animals who lived here evolved around 800,000 years ago or so, and they adapted to thrive in these conditions. But with the first interglacial, they would have experienced, well, you know, these mammoth steppe populations would have shrunk into pockets of refugia in the north. And any species that didn't migrate with them died out because, you know, their habitat was lost. So then you enter another glacial period, the mammoth steppe expands, and these specialized animals now get to inhabit a large range again. But now their numbers are reduced. Now, this process is repeated enough times until during the last glacial maximum, many of the megafauna might have been under threat, but were still holding up because mm. the mammoth step was there. But then here comes the bowling alley rod, things warm up, and now the mammoth step animals are on a knife edge to extinction. Now, the second point focuses on the younger Dryas itself. Now, across geologic time, sudden and uh, sudden climate changes can affect the evolution of organisms. You know, if a warm or a cold spell occurs far too quickly for an animal to adapt, well, it's likely to go extinct. Now, such a rapid cooling as the young Dryas, you know, would have thrown a wrench into any species that was attempting to adapt to another interglacial. Mm. Because you know, you're going from cool to warm, and then back to cool again in the span of only like 15,000 years or so. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it, it's still debatable just how much of an effect the younger Dryas had on megafaunal populations. I mean, there is some evidence to suggest that at least in a few parts of the world, the change in climate spurred species losses. Um, but it's still difficult to say. Mm -hmm. I mean, we certainly know that in regards to human communities, the younger Dryas had clear effects. I mean, again, remember the Natufians. Um, so if I haven't made it clear by now, you know, the discourse running this is insane. Mm. And it seems like this is a very complicated issue. And you know what? At the end of the day, maybe that's been the answer all along. <laughs> <laughs> you know, given the 45,000 year time span these extinctions occurred in, it is very probable that the loss of so many megafauna was a drawn out, complicated process and involving multiple factors. Mm. And that would have included climate change and human hunting. Mm -hmm. There was one paper from 2018 by Jack M. Broughton and Alec M. Witzel, who looked at evidence of population levels for both humans and megafauna in North America. And they also looked at climate data too. And they found that individual extinctions were the results of specific factors. Mm -hmm. so they had argued that um, some of the mammoth species as well as the horses and the saber-toothed cats were killed because of human hunting, while links to climate changes were made with the mastodon and the ground sloths. Hmm. And there were some cases where some mammoth species were tied to both of these factors. So, you know, personally, I, I often wonder if the focus on megafauna is not masking a larger picture. Hmm. We do have lots of evidence of the whole scale environmental changes that occurred in many of these places. Mm -hmm. and, and there were many different species of smaller animals, songbirds, marine invertebrates that also died out at the same time as the megafauna. You know, even if the total losses aren't as high or as diverse enough to be considered a mass extinction event, you know, maybe it's better to include the megafaunal extinctions in this global context 
if we want to find answers. Mm. I mean, I'm sure some researchers are already doing that, but I, I don't know any of the top of my head. Um, but, you know, the sort of, I, I think like, the sort of thing is comparable to asking, well, okay, what killed off the non-avian dinosaurs? And then only focusing on them versus the entire, you know, Cretaceous Paleogene extinction mm. event and all the other organisms that died out during that. Right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think the question of megafaunal extinctions has been a bit overblown mm. by this whole human hunting climate change discourse. Um, I mean, and we're, we're probably looking at a complex process that mm. involves, you know, multiple but not necessarily equal factors working together. Right. Um, uh, Albert, I would love to get your thoughts on this. <laughs> yeah, no, that that was really good. I think that was a very um, even-handed uh, coverage of this whole issue and. Uh, definitely, it's really complex. Um, I haven't uh, dived too deep into it myself, although I, I know the basic arguments for you know, the, each of the different hypotheses. And um, definitely, I'm not going to pretend I have any answers, but uh, I, I think I would generally agree that, yeah, it does make sense that um, probably there was a complex of, um, of extinction causes and uh, perhaps you know different species were affected to different degrees by different factors and uh definitely um it it can be a bit of a uh you know false dichotomy or you know multi dichotomy um to just try and single out um you know a single explanation for this entire kind of spread of of extinctions um yeah i you know it, it is really striking to me just how recently these extinctions occurred, I guess, in, you know, in geologic terms, like we kind of just missed all these spectacular creatures by, by that much. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's quite mind boggling to think about. Um, definitely. I, I talked a little bit about this in the Raptors episode that we did last week. Uh, like North America was home to like a bunch of uh, species of giant, very prominent, uh, majestic Raptor species. Um, from multiple different lineages, from the new world vultures and the terratorns from even the old world vultures um, that lived that lived in North America at the time. So no, I guess they wouldn't be considered old world exclusively then. <laughs> um, uh, we had like gigantic hawk species, uh, like several um, owl species that used to live around. Uh, and yeah, that, that's, a, that's a sort of diversity that is really hard to imagine in our current kind of ecosystems. Um, but uh, they they were around for a bit. Uh, it, it would be amazing to you know be able to travel just a few thousand years back in time to, to see them. Yeah, I mean, like like hitching a ride with the first Amerindians in North <laughs> America, and just that first shot of of wherever they landed, and and all these animals and plants. Like, right. Yeah, it is remarkable, and and yeah, I mean, like the loss of so many of these species, including the megafauna. You know that was, you know, th th this was severely felt around the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, y y you don't just remove hundreds of large animals from their environments and and then and think things will carry out the same. Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, these species were everywhere. I mean, they were near constant parts of the biosphere. Oh, right. Um, I mean, elephants. My goodness, I, I, it was normal for elephants and and their kin to be on all the continents yeah <laughs> and, and big cats big cats were everywhere um <laughs> well i mean except for australia yeah of course, right, but right. That, that's that's still a whole other thing um yeah it just you know th their demise changed things uh i mean for one thing you have like the flow of energy and nutrients in ecosystems mm -hmm. that all changes uh, the distribution of certain plant species yep. i mean the mm -hmm. composition of the soil you know these all changed they became different mm -hmm. i mean there's a, a number of plant species that seem to have lost their main dispersers yeah um this is what has been called a, a evolutionary anachronism mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of those plants either died out or they just very precariously survived right to the present day by like a very slim you know, miracle, if yeah. you will. Uh, so, like uh, one of these species you might recognize is the avocado. Oh, yeah. You know, the, the the seeds of avocados are huge, um, and they're so big because you know this is an adaptation to the guts of megafauna. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, ground sloths and and gomphotheres, so the, the, these kind of funky elephant relatives, you know, they would eat these and disperse the seeds everywhere. But with them gone, you know, no other animal 
is going to be able to digest those seeds without, you know, destroying them to eat. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was only through cultivation by Amerindians that the avocado was saved. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so, yeah, like the, the Joshua tree, the yeah. papaya, the pawpaw, you know, th there are other examples of this. Um, I guess they want to be technical, like the ginkgo too. Yeah, that's um, right. But, uh, that's a survivor from a much older mm -hmm. time. Right, right. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so like grassland environments, they all shrunk. I mean, you know, many of the browsing megafauna kept trees and shrubs in check. They were no longer around to do so. Mm -hmm. I mean, elephants today are, are a great example of this. You know, uh, they play a very key role in preserving the savanna right. by yeah. eating and trampling so many trees. Uh, I mean, the mammoth steppe, you know, the, that home to the cold adapted woolly species like the woolly mammoth, that is no longer around today. Mm -hmm. I mean, those very same places you know, the, 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 I mean, the, the species who lived in those places performed, you know, similar roles. They would keep certain plants at bay. Um, yeah, all the former mammoth steppe lands are now either wetland, forest, or tundra. Although I do know that there is one group, uh, a team behind the so-called Pleistocene Park. Mm -hmm, right. Um, that they, they bought land in northeast Siberia, and they've been introducing horses and bison and sheep and other things mm -hmm. to try to recreate this lost ecosystem. Right. Uh, which is an interesting experiment. Um, so yeah, these are just some of some like some of the notable effects of the megafauna extinctions. I mean, yeah, the, the structures of whole ecosystems shifted, and this changed how plants and animals, including ourselves, interacted with the world. I yeah. mean, the loss of so many big predators meant the loss of these landscapes of fear. Mm -hmm. So this right. is where herbivore numbers and ranges are managed just by the presence of large carnivores. Right they encourage them not to graze in certain places and allow other species to grow and to flourish. Um, we see this phenomena in Yellowstone, you know, historically, mm -hmm. when all the wolves were killed off and then reintroduced. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So no big predators or herbivores also means that food webs are diminished. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. they're replaced by mostly smaller grazing species whose actions can actually reduce biodiversity. So yeah, this, this was, this was much of the world that we inherited when the great Pleistocene epoch finally came to a close and then ushered in, if we go to the next slide, mm -hmm. the Holocene epoch. Yep. Mm. Yeah, which is marked by the end of the Younger Dryas 11.7 thousand years ago. Uh, so this is the time that we currently reside in. Um, for all intents and purposes, I mean, this is nothing more than an interglacial period. So far as we can tell, the ice age itself hasn't ended. Mm -hmm, right. I mean, there's still ice in Antarctica, for yep. one, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and parts of the Arctic. Mm -hmm. um, now, of course, how long that will be, that's, that's, a, that's a, well. another question. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I do know some scholars, including some of our close friends, who would prefer to see the Holocene as a distinct epoch be abandoned as a concept ah. <laughs> in favor of inclusion into the Pleistocene. Right, right. Because of the fact that it is an interglacial, yep. Mm. Um, of course, I, I am biased. Um, I, I still think that the Holocene and its subdivisions are helpful mm. in contextualizing events in geologic history. I mean, as far as the Quaternary period goes, this is like a truly unique time from the preceding, you know, two point four million years mm. or so. You know, especially when you factor in, you know, the global human impact on the environment. And it's, you know, probable effects, which are not insignificant. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a, uh, yeah, I've seen like, you know, the Holocene Epoch turned into like an age of the Pleistocene. Right. Uh, or, 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 of course, I've even seen the, qua the Quaternary as, mm -hmm. as a period, you know, uh, you're right. back when they had the, they were, they were changing the tertiary quaternary system to Paleogene and Neogene. That's right. The Quaternary was supposed to be in the, in the Neogene. That's right. But then, like they, they brought it back again, and yeah. that was like, no, no, it was perfect. You know, you, you it had good even spread. But yeah, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess my biggest thing, and, and, and Albert, you're welcome to chime in on this. I mean, at the end of the day, isn't a big purpose of the geologic time scale to kind of help us conveniently understand parts of the past? Yeah. So it's like like to, to have like the Holocene to like okay we we be sure that this is this is the time after the last ice age that we're in we can put it on a time scale and we can you know compare you know this time span to everything else mm -hmm. and and then 
work on it that way. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I, I do. I, I do like the Holocene <laughs> as a concept. Um, yeah, I. I think um I, I think like you know uh, I guess quote unquote objectively speaking obviously from the perspective of like deep time scales and the history of the entire Earth and all that yeah the the Holocene is like you know insignificant in turn in terms of like how long it has been compared to everything else but um also I think it is um quite understandable that we would have much better resolution of the events that went on uh, during this time period. Um, and would like a, a specific term to, you know, um, to encompass this time and, and talk about it. And, and so, yeah, so I, I'm definitely, um, um, you know, from a, um, I, I do like to promote, uh, a shift away from anthropocentrism, but I, I, and so I'm sympathetic towards like wanting to abolish <laughs> the, the Holocene and, and such, but, uh, I, I do, um, you know, understand that I, I think um, it, it does make it easier for us to talk about a lot of these events that we have, um, you know, a more, a greater resolution in terms of our understanding of in these relatively recent times um, and their relevance to kind of our origins in our current society. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I tend to agree with you there. Um, yeah, so like, as far as this series goes, you know, we're, we're, we're going to keep the Holocene. You're right. <laughs> Until like there's a very good reason not to. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. it's still in the international stratigraphic time scale, so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, it's not going anywhere anytime right. soon. Right. Um, speaking of which, you know, the Holocene has been recently divided, hmm. so it finally has official ages now. Right. Um, you know, an early, a middle, and a late, which is funny because for years and years and years that the Holocene has been around, you know, people would write about you know early Holocene, late Holocene in like research papers and books and stuff. But these were all relative to what the authors were specifying. Mm, right, right. So, like, like when, they, when they would say like the early Holocene, like it was based on like their terms. There wasn't there wasn't like a mutually agreed mm -hmm. early Holocene. Yep. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, recently, like the the Stratigraphic Union has um, ratified these names, and so now we have three ages, three official ages for the Holocene, and and these correspond to significant climate changes on the Earth. So we have the Greenlandian, the North Grippian, and the Megalayan Ages. And I'll be sure to discuss each of these as the series continues. Because, um, I mean, we're, we're going to be staying in the Holocene <laughs> for the rest of it. Right. So it's good to kind of be familiar with these. Now, this chart here just gives a bit of a, a brief summary of the past 11,700 years. Um, the general trend is, you know, gradually warming temperatures, followed by slightly cooling of the climate, before anthropogenic warming suddenly changes things. Mm. Um, it, it's during this time that, you know, our global human civilization emerged, you know, including increased sedentism, and agriculture, metallurgy, writing, cities, states, whatever. I mean, our population as a, a large mammalian species has skyrocketed beyond what is typically seen for megafauna. And, and our expansion across the planet was virtually complete. Um, I mean, every landmass that is habitable for humans has been settled. Hmm. And, and, and as we discussed in the last episode, you know, there's small groups of humans in Antarctica as well um, as, as an underground. Hmm. Um, and now, of course, human settlements in the ocean. I mean, that, that, that's an ongoing <laughs> question. Uh, we're, we're not there yet, but we'll, you know, I'm sure people are working on that. All right. <laughs> so, uh, let's jump to the next slide. Um, these maps come from a 2018 study by uh, Mika Talvara and colleagues. And they describe how various factors, including biodiversity, primary productivity, and the presence of disease-carrying organisms, have affected where human populations have settled and how dense these settlements are. Um, I mean, we've managed to make a home just about everywhere, as I've just said. But in the time when everyone was a forager, so nomadic, semi-sedentary, or sedentary, you know, what home was like played a role in how many people lived there. So the average carrying capacity for foraging peoples, so that is how many individuals can be supported on present resources, tends to be higher in subtropical and temperate environments where biodiversity is highest and net productivity is fairly strong. 
the presence of pathogens in tropical environments have influenced human settlement as well. And there are many instances where a high rate of disease carrying species have limited population densities, you know, despite their high biodiversity and high you know, primary productivity. Um, now, these maps, I should mention, like they aren't the end all of this discussion. Mm. I mean, for one thing, they, they don't show these factors in a marine context. Um, that, that there's evidence around the world that high population densities of humans can be supported by the abundant resources of the oceans. Mm -hmm. um, you know, nor does it suggest that these factors are strictly determinant of where humans live. I, I mean, environmental determinism has been you know, extensively criticized by anthropologists for being way too simplistic. Um, and, and there are like racist undertones as well um, that have been historically added to that. Um, you know, the, the idea that the environment alone makes you who you are to the point where like it affects your like temperament and, and, and mental abilities, which, yeah, that's no, that's, <laughs> that's not, that's, that's not a thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, just because, you know, a part of the world has a high number of pathogens or it lacks a high biodiversity, you know, that, that doesn't mean that any humans who live there are impoverished or worse off than those in less disease carrying biodiverse places. Mm -hmm. I mean, human agency is a powerful thing and, and we're very good at adapting to most environments. I mean, again, we are generalist specialists after all. Um, now one interesting find on these maps is that many of the places where agriculture emerged are within biodiverse, high productive environments. Mm -hmm. And the implications of this are interesting, uh, but we're gonna save that for the next episode. Mm -hmm. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, yeah, this paper just came out this week. Like, <laughs> right. Yeah, it's, it, I, I, I'm floored by how often this has been happening. <laughs> um, so you know, it fits very well with this episode, and I wanted to, to talk about it a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, what this map shows, and the subsequent charts here, is the total change in global environments from wild habitats to human habitats, or what are known as anthromes. Never before in the history of the Hominidae has so much of the Earth's surface been altered by human activity. Um, I mean, that is very clear today. But at the start of the Holocene, that was still true. Um, what this study, and this is by Early C. Ellis and colleagues, found was that around 12,000 years ago, so at the, at the cusp of the Holocene, Almost three quarters of the total land area on the Earth was inhabited and altered by human beings. And that included over 95% of its temperate forests mm. and 90% of its tropical forests. And that was 12,000 years ago. All right. So, like, you know, so called wild lands, you know, the wilderness, you know, they were actually often heavily influenced by human activities. Mm -hmm. You know, in this case, sedentary settlements intensive foraging, uh, environmental maintenance through the encouragement of, you know, favored species. You, know, you had these wild gardens. Um, there was controlled hunting and land management with fire, um, as well as like, you know, the clearing of forests, which is a thing that would happen. Um, now, that's not to say that all of these are bad. You know, we're not saying, oh, the wilderness is, is like a fraction of a percent left. You know, what have we done? Mm -hmm. No, no, no. You know, Many of these activities actually do promote biodiversity, right? And, and they encourage the growth and expansion of certain biomes. I mean, really, we are megafauna, and, and we shape the environment in much the same way that an elephant or a lion does. And, and this sort of maintenance is at the heart of indigenous communities today, as well as in the past. You know, as much of the world transitioned into agricultural societies, these practices continued alongside them. And within them too, you know, in the Americas especially, you know, farming practices were often never at the expense of non-domesticated organisms. You know, it's with you know modern colonial times when many of these carefully managed lands were seen incorrectly as wilderness or untamed nature, and so these particular practices practices by you know industrialized you know, colonial nations. You know, have never really been understood or truly appreciated until recently. 
Um, as we'll see in later episodes, you know, this has been at our expense. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, Albert, is there anything you'd like to add regarding the the Holocene? Um, there are probably things I could say, but no, not not specific to, to this, I think. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, then, on that case, let's go to the, the next slide. So, yeah, uh, the, the first age of the Holocene is known as the Greenlandian, uh, which lasted from the end of the Younger Dryas, 11.7 thousand years ago, to 8.2 thousand years ago. Hmm. Now, the Greenland-inspired name is due to the North Greenland Ice Core Project, which took a sample down to the bedrock in 2003. And I highlight where that was on the map here to the right. Um, it was this core sample that was used to ratify the official start date for the Holocene itself mm. back in the day. Um, and so with the publishing of this 2018 study that named all these new Holocene ages, well, they, they used this core to also define the span of the Greenlandian. Now, basically, the warming trend that had begun prior to the Younger Dryas interruption continued through the Greenlandian. And the biggest changes occurring among the global human population, which is estimated to have grown from about 4 million at its start to 11 million by its end, was that agricultural societies emerged in multiple locations. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the African humid period was still in place. Um, uh, you know, many parts of the continent resumed its support of you know, the warmer and wetter environments. So the Sahara was still mostly grassland and wetland, and you know there were actually increases in human communities about this time. Um, the Ibero-Marusian culture developed into the Capsian culture around 10.5 thousand years ago, which was directly ancestral to the pre-agricultural Maghreb populations that have traditionally been known as Berbers. Um, but I must stress that this is a derogatory label. Mm. Um, it comes from the Greek word for barbarian. Yeah. So if that tells you anything. Uh, so it's appropriate you know, to refer to this ethnic group by the name that they call themselves. That is the uh, Amazir. Now, uh, in a similar trend seen among the, the Nile communities, who also developed the first African pottery around this time, uh, the Capsians were intensifying their collection of grasses. And other peoples across Africa were readjusting to the lusher conditions. But of course, this wasn't always peaceful. Um, we talked about the Nadaruk massacre in episode eight. Uh, that occurred 10,000 years ago mm. during this time. Uh, you can see one of the casualties, actually, at the image at the bottom at the, the bottom here that has oh, been yeah. illustrated, you know, people that have been bound and then struck over the head and arms with a blunt object, truly horrifying. Um, moving into Eurasia, you know, conditions really shifted in the Arabian Peninsula, which actually started its own humid period 10,000 years ago. So rainfall increased and the number of paleo lakes grew and Arabia turned green, what we call a green Arabia period. Uh, humans settled across this lush region, and they built all sorts of stone structures called kites that were used for actually corralling hoofed mammals hmm. during hunts. So they lead a bunch of gazelles or, or wild donkeys into these things, and then they could kill them easier there, you know, like, like a pit. Hmm. Um, further north in the Fertile Crescent and along the hilly flanks of the Zagros and the Levant, the greater management of wild lands and the intense cultivation of wild plants did lead to the earliest emergences of agriculture anywhere in the world. So the, the first domestic plant species that we can be confident existed with the first agricultural societies were emmer and acorn wheat, barley, chickpeas, lentils, and fig trees. Hmm. Um, and in time, livestock would be domesticated too, uh, particularly ca cattle, sheep, and goats. Um, villages would emerge, and by 10.3 thousand years ago, the famous site of Jericho actually grew to an over 40,000 square meter walled settlement. So yeah, urbanization just kicks up a notch by this time. Mm. Uh, Europe remained a land of foraging peoples uh, who are now recognized as Mesolithic cultures. Um, <laughs> a quick aside for the series, Mesolithic translates to Middle Stone Age. Yeah. Mm. 
but this is not the same thing as the Middle Stone Age of Africa oh, right. and of other regions. Um, it, it, it's a bit confusing, um, but j just to be clear, up until this time in human history, all stone tool cultures are known as Paleolithic. So Africa's Middle Stone Age would be translated as the African Middle Paleolithic. Hmm. So the African Middle, the African Old Middle Stone Age, right. if you like. <laughs> um, so yeah like t just to kind of ease this confusion um which i know is, is it can be a pain in the butt um you know the term mesolithic is usually reserved for the european archaeological record so other parts of the world you know they have their own terms so uh like there's epipaleolithic in southwest asia um there's archaic in the americas um for example so i, I hope that, that that clears things up a, a little mm -hmm. bit um, but, and we'll talk more about Mesolithic Europe later. Um, but what's, what's important about the Greenlandian in Europe is that the glaciers had receded enough for people to settle in Scandinavia for the first time. Now, while this new space would be enjoyed until the present day, the land that connected the British Isles to Europe, what is known as Doggerland, would find itself under the waves. So beginning about 8.5 thousand years ago and until the end of the Greenlandian, Rapid flooding caused by rising sea levels submerged these lowlands into what would become the English Channel. And so to this day, you, you have archaeologists and non-specialists alike that will dredge up, you know, peat and, and human artifacts from the bottom of the sea. Mm. <laughs> it's really incredible. Um, towards the eastern parts of Eurasia, uh, there were demographic shifts and sedentism that marked human societies. So in Siberia, you know, we had talked about you know, the shifts that had completely replaced the ancient North Eurasians with the Paleo-Siberian populations by 11,000 years ago, well, they were affected yet again by new arrivals from East Asia. Uh, these are known as Neo-Siberians, and they began to displace the Paleo-Siberian communities until about 4,000 years ago. Um, but this was not a total replacement like what had happened before. You know, we don't have ancient North Eurasians anymore. But, you know, we, we do have Paleo-Siberian populations, you know, and large clusters of these managed to retain their, you know, homelands in the Northeast. Hmm. Um, so just as an aside, the, the Neo-Siberian ancestry is reflected among a number of ethnic groups that are known in Siberia until the age of Russian expansion. So that those are the, the Tungusic-speaking peoples. So you have the Evens and the Jurchen who have played a role, or the, their descendants play a role in the founding of the, the Qing dynasty in China. Um, speaking of East Asia, um, sedentism increased as it had in the Southwest, and with villages and agriculture emerging there twice by the end of the Greenlandian. Um, Southeast Asia, uh, Sunda began to lose its lowlands as the sea levels rose, and they caused that sort of dramatic flooding I was telling you about. So yeah, um, Sunda was on borrowed time. Hmm. Um, but during this age, Sahul's time had definitely run out. Um, as I mentioned before, New Guinea and Australia separated by 10.5 thousand years ago. So the Taurus Strait emerges. And Tasmania was severed by 10,000 years ago. And this only helped to further cause distinctions and diversifications among these land masses. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in Tasmania especially, human societies there remained isolated from everyone until Europeans showed up in the 1770s AD. Um, but the same couldn't be said for Australia and New Guinea, however. Uh, the the pitter-patter of fluffy paws <laughs> signaled the arrival of the dingo mm -hmm. and the New Guinea singing dog by around 8.3 thousand years ago. Um, there's a remarkable 2020 genetic study by a Zhao Zhe Shang and colleagues that helped discover this. Um, the ancestors of these dogs emerged from East Asia and they traveled through Sunda around 9.9 thousand years ago. And then they arrived in Australasia afterwards. Now, given that the dingo and the New Guinea singing dog descend from domestic dogs, well, they must have, you know, arrived on both of these land masses with human beings. Mm -hmm. But to date, we have no idea who they were. Wow. You know, there, there's nothing in the archaeological or the genetic record at the moment that hints this. Um, and evidence that, of that sort that does exist, which is still very contested, and in fact, recently has been failed to be replicated, 
Um, so like, like they found evidence of, of uh, gene flow from India in Australian, in mm -hmm. some Australian populations that would have occurred around 4,000 years ago. But that, that genetic signature has failed to be replicated. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in any case, that, that, that's still too late in time to explain how the dingo got to Australia. Right. So there, there's a big mystery there that's waiting to be solved. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so uh, the Bering Strait closed 11,000 years ago. And with the loss of most megafauna around that time, the Amerindian societies transitioned away from big game hunting and they began to undergo regionalization. Mm -hmm. uh, the general outline of the American ecosystems became standardized during the Holocene Epoch. So conditions became drier in the North American West. So we create the deserts of the Southwest and then the Mediterranean climate of California. Uh, conditions grow warmer and more forested in the North American East. So we have a drier seasonal climate affecting present day Florida and Louisiana. Um, of course, the force of Mesoamerica, the Amazon, and the South American Atlantic expanded as well. Uh, in anthropology, uh, the term culture area is often used to delineate the various regional adaptations Amerindians made to these new environments. So the eastern woodland cultures tended to focus on a broad spectrum of forest resources, like you know, white-tailed deer, uh, berries, and sunflowers while the Brazilian highland cultures, you know, traveled through the savannas and they went after tapirs and tinamous and manioc. Hmm. Um, you know, as in Africa and Eurasia, uh, sedentism and intensive cultivation emerged multiple times in the Americas during this time. Um, and agriculture is just on the horizon. Um, for example, squash may have actually been domesticated in Central America as early as 10,000 years ago. So very early date for you squash fans out there. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, uh, the human range expansions um, that were a highlight of the Pleistocene only continued further mm. in the Holocene. And you know, a number of regions were first peopled by foraging societies during this time. So let's go ahead and meet three of these movements beginning on the next slide. All right. So the melting of glaciers following the end of the last glacial period opened up the northern lands of Scandinavia around mm. 12 to 11,000 years ago. And they created, you know, the cool Arctic to subarctic environment that characterizes this region. So, you know, boreal forests and reindeer. And uh, immediately as these conditions changed, humans moved northward. As the archaeological evidence points to settlements reaching above the Arctic Circle by 10,000 years ago. So this place was settled quick. Um, ancient DNA has helped figure this out. Um, the evidence points to Scandinavia being settled twice, actually. First by Mesolithic foragers of Western Europe, so they entered through present-day Denmark, and then later by Eastern European foragers who expanded through the present-day Northwest Russia. Now, the, the admixture of these two peoples within the region led to the ancestry of what are known as Scandinavian foragers, and they managed to retain a hunter-gatherer lifestyle for many thousands of years afterwards. Um, this is best expressed in the pitted ware culture of 5.5 to 4.3 thousand years ago that actually coexisted with the emerging agricultural societies of Northern Europe. Um, now of related interest, the Sami people who incidentally received you know, a bit of a surge of pop culture presence back in 2019. Mm -hmm. um, so you had Frozen 2 right. and the Christmas movie Klaus uh, featuring Sami characters. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the latter is my personal favorite of those two. <laughs> um, but although they are considered indigenous peoples of Scandinavia today, they actually do not share ancestry with the Scandinavian foragers. Mm -hmm. um, the genetic studies that have been done indicate that much of their ancestry actually hails from Siberia. And they had actually only expanded into Scandinavia within the last few thousand years or so, where there was further admixture with resident Europeans. Um, but it must be stressed that you know, Scandinavian foragers, you know, like the ancient North Eurasians, you know, like that is not a culture and a people that exists anymore. Uh, but the Sami do. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. they remain the stewards of Scandinavia today. Right. Now, quite a number of sites have been found here, and they reveal very widespread human adaptations to this cold world. Um, you know, among the earliest is the Fasna-Hensbaka complex, 
uh, who were reindeer and red deer hunters, but they became increasingly specialized towards marine resources. You know, they, they would take deer antlers and bones and then carve them into barbed harpoons and fish hooks. And then they would use these wooden boats to go out uh, in both the freshwater and saltwater regions for fish and the marine mammals. So seals were very popular. Um, Scandinavian forager homes were constructed of wood and bark, and they made they were made semi-subterranean. So they were actually dug into the earth to help with insulation, mm -hmm. what are known as pit houses. And these were used for the most part year round. And these settlements would only grow in size as the Holocene progressed. So that's Scandinavia. What's the next land mass that we're gonna we're gonna settle on? Well, if we go to the next slide, so with the peopling of Tierra del Fuego 10,000 years ago, the only places left unpopulated in the Americas was the High Arctic and the Caribbean archipelago. Hmm. Now, the latter was settled first, but because these islands were never connected to the mainland during the end of the last glacial maximum, you know, humans had to use boats to get there. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Now, the first steps onto the islands started from Trinidad and Tobago around 8,000 years ago. And this is by cultures that have been named the Orderoid. This is after a, a midden site of Orderoy in Trinidad. Now, unfortunately, while we know a fair amount about the culture of these people, it's typical of pre-ceramic archaic age on Merindians, you know, they, they hunt a wide range of land and sea animals. Um, their movements into the Caribbean are lesser known. Mm. Um, a number of scattered sites from Trinidad to Martinique to Antigua, and then on to the Leeward and Virgin Islands after 5,000 years ago, do suggest that jump dispersals were made. So remember, we talked about this in the last episode. You bypass some islands in favor of others. So it's not like a complete sweep through a region. Um, but a lot of these sites have not been properly dated. And on top of that, we have no genetic evidence for the orderoid expansions. Hmm. So... There's still a little bit of mystery regarding them. But the same can't be said for the second movement into the Caribbean by the Casimiroid cultures. Mm. And they owe their name to the site of Casimira in the Dominican Republic. Now, here, the ancient DNA uh, research, as well as archaeology, has been very good. And they clearly show that these peoples entered the Caribbean from Central America around 6,000 years ago. Now, more direct links have been made to groups in present-day Belize, where these stone tool technologies have similar uh, structures and forms. Now, from the mainland, they seem to have actually bypassed Jamaica, again, another, another jump dispersal, and they settled in Cuba before moving through Hispaniola, which is Haiti and the Dominican Republic, before reaching Puerto Rico by 5,000 years ago. And there they might have interacted with the incoming orderoid peoples, you know, as the island contains sites associated with both, um, but the evidence is a little bit lacking on that front for the moment. Um, the foragers of the Caribbean went after a wide range of foods, and that includes marine resources. Um, shellfish in particular seem to have been highly valued, and we find middens containing piles of shells across many of these different islands. Um, evidence also suggests that both the Casimiroid and the Orderoid cultures engaged in intensive cultivation of certain fruit trees and grasses. And they often manage the land by setting fires to the forests. Now, after 5,000 years ago, interestingly, there is a rise in marine resource extraction and a drop in terrestrial hunting. Hmm. So we were alluding to this a little bit earlier. Uh, at the time that humans began to settle in the Caribbean, there were quite a number of unique species living there as island ecosystems tend to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And these included a number of dwarf ground sloths that had outlasted their larger relatives during the mainland megafaunal extinctions. Mm -hmm. The last of these animals died out between six and 4,000 years ago. And many researchers are convinced that the most likely cause has been tied to human activity. Mm -hmm. you know, they had lasted so long on the islands, and then humans show up, and then boom, there's no more little ground sloths. You're right. Um, you know, the, the, this wouldn't be the first time this happened when humans entered new islands. Mm -hmm. you know, as, as we'll see, this, this would not be the last. So let's move to the next slide now. Yep. And we look at the American Arctic, which was peopled much later 
than in the Caribbean, mm. simply because the conditions were not suitable to human habitation. I mean, yeah, you know, peoples have been making journeys into the Siberian Arctic for at least 40,000 years, mm. um, but glacial cover there was not as widespread as it was in the Americas. Um, you know, the two massive ice sheets halted any human expansions northward for many thousands of years after the last glacial maximum, you know, as time was needed for them to melt enough for the conditions to be just right. So even though we had the ancient Beringians who had made a home in present-day Alaska prior to 11.5 thousand years ago, they did not expand eastwards. And actually, their genetic signature was absorbed into the southern Amerindian populations that expanded north into Canada. So yeah, we, we don't have ancient Beringians today as a distinct people, so far as we know. Um, so yeah, from there, Alaska was home to the descendants of these admixture events, the what are known as the Paleoarctic cultures, um, who were still confined to this part of the world, and they only made movements into the Aleutian Islands southwards by 8,000 years ago. But the, there's still no attempts to get any higher into the Arctic. Well, that would be until about roughly 5,000 years ago that humans began to expand into the American Arctic uh, with uh, significant numbers. Now, archaeologists have long recognized these peoples as belonging under the name of Paleo-Eskimo, mm -hmm. but it needs to be stressed, again, that this is a derogatory word by the native peoples of the Arctic. Um, you know, regardless of the discourse about you know where it exactly originated and what it means, mm. uh, there's, apparently there's been many different suggestions. Uh, so in this series, you know, I prefer to use another name that's also available: uh, Pre Thule, mm. as it places these cultures in context with Greater Arctic history. Now, genetics have revealed that these peoples share a common ancestry with the Paleo Siberians, who had gradually settled in northern Eurasia between 20 to 11,000 years ago. And it seems like the place of origin for the pre Thule was from the northeast of Siberia. From there, they spread to Alaska and onwards across the northern Canadian islands and reached western Greenland by 4,000 years ago. The spread of these peoples has been well documented in the archaeological record uh, because we have a number of tool technologies that have been associated with them. So, for example, in Alaska, between 4.3 to 3.5 thousand years ago, uh, the pre Thule groups used the Arctic small tool tradition, which prioritized stone and bone microblades for use with spears and the bow and arrow. Uh, they were big game hunters. They went after musk ox and caribou in particular. Mm. Uh, caribou, I must remind you all, is America's reindeer. Mm -hmm. And uh, these small tools were efficient for you know quickening the blood loss of their prey. Now, as the pre Thule groups spread into Western Canada, they become known under different toolkits. So by the time they reach uh, Eastern Canada, they're known as the independence cultures, where they still retain a mostly land-based diet, but they were crafting larger hunting tools. And when they reach parts of lower Greenland, they're known as the Sakak culture. Um, both of these pre-Thule peoples you know, were living in increasingly colder conditions. And at least the Sakak cultures adapted by incorporating marine mammals into their diets for the first time. Uh, we find the remains of both seals and orcas that have been found at various sites hmm. where people's actually built kayaks to go after them. Now, eventually, all these cultural traditions faded out and they were replaced by the new Dorset tradition by 2,500 years ago. It's with these peoples that the mixing of land and marine based foraging strategies was intensified. Um, their toolkit was very diverse. And they actually included what are known as soapstone oil lamps. So these were made from seal oil or whale blubber that was burned on a grass or mosque wick inside a carved soapstone dish. Uh, of course, provided warmth. Uh, these would have been regularly maintained. So whenever a Dorset family had to go somewhere, you know, there was always somebody who had to make sure that the lighted lamp was carried with them and remained lit. Um, you know, for as long as possible. Um, so in order to hunt seals more efficiently, they develop new technologies. So this is the first time that we see sleds for traveling on the ice flows. Um, we, we see the special ice creeper boots. So they would fasten antler pieces on the soles of their shoes to make basically cleats. So that way there was no slippage on the ice. Um, but what's really interesting to note is that 
though the pre Thule peoples brought hunting dogs with them into the Americas, so this, this would mark the second time that dogs were introduced hmm. onto these land masses, by the time that the Dorset traditions show up, their use actually vanishes from the archaeological record, hmm. uh, along with the bow and arrow. Um, we don't know why this is, but it seems at least that the Dorset could go along just fine with their, you know, their usual stone and bone harpoons and spears. Um, we see some archaeological sites that show that they were that this was enough to kill a polar bear, for example. So th- they were doing pretty good, um, but things would change very soon for them, and very quickly. Around 2,200 years ago, a new people emerged from northeast Siberia, and they also shared a common ancestry with the pre Thule as well as the Paleo Siberians. And these were, and you can probably guess, these were the Thule peoples. Hmm. Uh, they originated as primarily mammal, you know, marine mammal hunters, going after prey as large as a bowhead whale. Hmm. That they used not only kayaks, but also umioks, which they would actually construct with a, a wood and bone frame, and then they would stretch a, skeel, a seal skin over that to make the hull. I mean, their rapid expansion across the American Arctic, which began 1.12 thousand years ago, so that's 900 AD, was facilitated by a fascinating change in climate that is known as the medieval warm period. This lasted from about 950 to 1250 AD, and it brought notable changes to a number of world societies which we'll talk about later on. By 1000 AD, the Thule peoples had reached eastern Canada, and by 1300 AD, they had settled in both western and eastern Greenland. It's worth mentioning that these movements were parallel with the Norse expansions into Arctic North America, which were also a result of the medieval warm period. Now, they had already set up colonies in Greenland around 986 AD under Eric the Red, and they had set foot on North American soil around 1000 AD under Leif Erikson, who called the land Vimlin, after the wild grapes that were found there. Hmm. Uh, cultural interactions between the Thule and the Norse were not always friendly, but the opportunities for trade were worth any squabbles. Uh, the Thule peoples actually cherished meteoric iron, which they often collected from fall sites across the Arctic to kind of reshape into tools and these would be a lot more durable than bone. Uh, and they would also mine native copper as well. Um, of course, the Norse being an iron-using culture, they often traded their tools with the Thule in exchange for walrus ivory, which they would travel far and wide to Scandinavia to sell. Now, with all this rapid expansion of Thule peoples, well, what happened to the pre-Thule Dorset culture? Well, genetics and archaeology with a little help from indigenous oral histories, have more or less solved this case. Uh, Today, the Dorset no longer exists as a distinct people or a culture. As the Thule expanded into the American Arctic, they came into contact with the Dorset, and although they often coexisted with them for anywhere from about 50 to 200 years on average, even sharing technologies on occasion, in the end, the Dorset were completely displaced. Uh, Genetics shows that there was little to no admixture between the Dorset and the Thule. And according to the oral traditions, uh, the demand for meteoric iron played a role in many disputes, where the Dorset peoples, who are actually referred to as the Tunyat, were driven away and or killed. Hmm. By 1000 AD, perhaps a little bit later than this, any traces of the Dorset people are gone. Uh, Now, curiously, the pre-Thule ancestry does survive in living populations. Uh, genetics have revealed that part of this ancestry that is found among the Na Dene speaking Amerindians of the Western Canadian Arctic, um, or the subarctic, I should say, uh, that is pre Thule in origin. There seems to have been admixture events that occurred between five and 2,500 years ago. Uh, the uh, the Na Dene speakers are represented today by a number of Native American nations. So you have the Klingit of the Pacific Northwest. You have the Dene Salin or the Chippewan, Canada, and you have the Apache and the Dene or the Navajo nations of the American Southwest. Mm. Um, and that was a, a much later movement uh, from the north around sometime after a thousand years ago or so. The dates are disputed. Um, but then, you know, 
what what of the the Norse colonies in America then? Well, as one of our wonderful viewers, Robert Miller, commented in the last episode of this series, you know their insistence in using Scandinavian subsistence techniques, so crop farming and sheep rearing, and the fact that they did not incorporate any knowledge from the Thule meant that when the climate cooled again during the Little Ice Age, which began around 1315 AD, their populations were not equipped to survive the intensifying cold. Mm. And so one by one, Norse villages and fields were abandoned during harsh winters and harsh summers. And it's by 1450 that all of the American colonies are deserted. And so it's with the Thule and their deep knowledge of the Arctic environment that persists today as the peoples of the American Arctic. Mm. And their descendants include the Inuit, uh, the Inupiat, the Yupik, and the Aleut nations uh, who have remained with their homelands and have provided much guidance for archaeologists into the prehistory of the Arctic. So if we go real quickly to the next slide, um, this chart just shows the overall chronology of cultures in the American Arctic across 6,000 mm. years. And, and you can really see <laughs> how long the pre-Thule cultures had free reign of the place. Yeah. They're shown here in blue. Um, and just how rapid their replacement by the Thule peoples was. Now, the Thule are here in red. Um, and just for reference, um, the maritime archaic in copper below, uh, those are older Amerindian cultures. Um, and if you look very closely in, in the little green part there, that, that's the Norse settlements mm. on the right. Um, and so that concludes the forager expansions around the world during the Holocene. Uh, Albert, is there anything you wanted to add about these peoples? Uh, not especially, but uh, it is fascinating to hear about all of these, and it clearly very complex histories here. <laughs> yeah, uh, the Arctic expansions in particular are really fascinating to me just because of how recent they were. Mm, right. I mean, when you're talking about, you know, 2,500 years ago, you know, that is, you know, within historical times. Right, I mean, right. uh, 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 everything that we're reading about in, you know, uh, classical Greece and Rome and, 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 dynastic China, for example, while all that stuff was going on, you know, there were still large parts of the world that were, you know, being populated by peoples, mm -hmm. um, including places where people had never gone before. Um, and so that, that's just fascinating to me, really. Absolutely. So let's jump to the next slide now. Um, I've been talking quite a lot about sedentary forager societies, but, you know, what exactly does that mean? You know, what makes these foraging communities different from nomadic ones? Well, as I mentioned in episode eight, uh, cross-cultural comparative studies of ethnographic data can provide us with insights into the lives of prehistoric peoples, but they are not direct substitutes for understanding them. Mm -hmm. As always, we must look to the evidence from archaeology in order to see whether any observations hold water. Um, as far as sedentary forager societies go, we honestly don't have a huge sample size to look from like we do for nomadic forager societies and on a limited global scale. And that's simply because most of these sedentary societies or the sedentary forager societies in prehistory have taken up horticulture and agriculture into historical times. Mm -hmm. And so when that's during those cases, you know, that, that's not really helpful for our purposes here. Um, the vast majority of ethnographies come from North America, particularly along the Pacific coast, um, as well as in Southern Florida, uh, which is where the fascinating Calusa nation is based. Um, and then we have the indigenous Ainu of Japan and a couple New Guinea societies, like the uh, Kwawanak uh, Asimot. Pardon my pronunciation. Um, but that's it, you know, hmm. as far as living peoples go. Um, but still, you know, these have given these have been enough to give us some idea about you know what the average sedentary forager society was like. Mm. And the biggest difference between the two types of foragers is that obviously these have taken up sedentism. You know, moving away from home was very restricted, and the community stayed year round in one location with less land area than a nomadic forager used, uh, because people couldn't easily move to another location. You know, any problems like food shortage or internal disputes had to be resolved right there. And this also meant that the overall population density grew to encompass more people than is seen in nomadic societies. Uh, on average, a nomadic forager society 
um, will consist of anywhere from six to 75 people. And this number, remember, fluctuates because uh, nomadic forager societies use fish and fusion relationships. Um, sedentary societies can support many more hundreds of people, hmm. uh, even breaking a thousand in some in some estimates. To house everyone, well, dwellings had to be built to last, and they remained at least semi-permanent structures on the landscape. Uh, buildings were often strategically grouped alongside high traffic areas like rivers and coastlines, and the houses hold multiple families. And these structures could grow to many hundreds or thousands of square meters in size, if necessary. Uh, many of these societies effectively lived in self-contained villages. So it's with these communities that the village becomes a first in human history. A, uh, a key distinction about sedentary settlements is that there were often special buildings that were erected solely for the storage and preservation of food surpluses. Because, I mean, it was absolutely important for sedentary societies to intensively harvest as many resources as possible while they're available to ensure that, you know, when harsher periods come, there's enough food to feed everyone. And so that required special technologies and skills to develop to keep foods fresher for longer. Uh, you know, we talk about ice age foragers and how they would use the permafrost as a refrigerator. You know, they bury meat and bones for later periods. Well, the invention of pottery in different parts of the world was valuable to this, you know, uh, although pottery may have been initially invented as cooking devices, you know, clay pots could also be used as storage containers to protect plant foods from hungry animals, as well as the elements. Um, of course, baskets had been previously used for these purposes, and in many cases, they continue to do so as well. Uh, people also learn how to prepare animal flesh and keep it from spoiling. So sun drying, uh, smoking, the salting of meats, that shows up for the first time. Mm. Um, and you know, the more food than can be possibly eaten in one season, the better. Um, you, know, you, you don't want all your supplies to run out during the winter. Mm. And you know, when it's too harsh to go out and hunt for fresher things. So it's all surplus, surplus, surplus. Um, you know, living in a sedentary society was hard work in, in this case. I mean, you know, all the benefits of moving somewhere better were lost once these communities came to live permanently in one small location. You know, the road towards the type of society and politics that we deal with in the present day was paved by sedentary foragers because it's with them that we see the first clear evidence of social stratification and inequality and leadership by the few or the one. You know, a, a lot of ink has been spilled on this subject, so I'll just give the basics. Nomadic forager societies, as you may remember, do not usually have formal leaders. You know, individuals who had gained enough experience over time could act as providers of knowledge and insight. Mm. But decisions made regarding the entire group were often decided by the entire group. And if someone didn't like a choice that was made, then they had the choice to leave the group what's been referred to as voting on your feet. Now, uh, the semi-sedentary forest societies of the Ice Age in Europe took a slight departure from this. You know, as we just discussed, you know, often individual communities would band together voluntarily under a common name for a longer period of time. And occasionally decisions would be made by a council or at the very least by a few select individuals who were bonded by kinship. Uh, the theme here is ever-increasing populations of people. The higher density seen in sedentary forager societies was coupled with limited mobility. The processes of hunting and gathering change under these circumstances. You know, it's, it's no longer enough to bring home you know, one antelope or one deer and then successfully divide it amongst everyone. Mm. You know, when you live with hundreds of other people, that's just not feasible. So hunters needed to bring back much more game than they originally would and gatherers needed to collect many more plants and small animals than they originally would. So therefore, food acquisition is a longer and more intense process under a larger sedentary community. Over time, communities would be required to divide up labor between individuals and secure people into specialized jobs. But as I've just explained, you know, food preservation and storage became a prominent necessity so people were often placed with the responsibility of, say, smoking the fish mm. or creating the pots to store the grains and seeds. 
and if the ethnographic record is any clue, this is when we really begin to see the division of labor by gender and age. Uh, women would usually be stuck as food processors and children would take up more jobs than they normally would. You know, they less time for play, really. Uh, add to all of this the overall change in land use. I mean, if you're a large community staying put in one place, your home might just so happen to be the most productive place for certain resources. And your group lays claim to that territory. And so then everybody else in every other community won't have access to that. Um, you know, it might be good to establish trade between groups, but more often than not, it might also be good to take what your neighbors have by force, especially if your group is struggling to feed themselves. And if your group is doing well enough already, getting all the food they need year after year, then there's really no incentive to find help from other people. Uh, so, I mean, you, you can just kind of hoard everything yourselves and, you know, screw everybody else. Um, and so thus begins a very nasty cycle mm. where sedentary communities invest more time defending themselves against their neighbors by building barricades and planning for wars or mm. raiding parties even. Uh, the archaeological record documents this trend as it is with the emergence of sedentary societies at the end of the last glacial maximum that we begin to see greater evidence of deaths by warfare between communities. Now, in order to coordinate all these diverse activities and divisions of labor, leadership arose. Uh, an individual or a group of individuals became necessary to process and plan for this increase in group responsibility. If a, if a particular job wasn't being done, they took charge to make sure somebody would do it. Uh, if somebody was slacking off or not contributing to the group, then they took charge to punish them. And if there was just too much to do or not enough people for a particular job then there's the incentive to capture people from a neighboring community and enslave them yeah it's with the rise in sedentary societies that we see the very first instances of human slavery mm -hmm. um, although this was technically different from the later forms of chattel slavery um, most of the time an enslaved person could earn back their freedom but it was still a shitty situation. Mm -hmm. uh, leaders in this instance exercise their authority outside their family group to the total of the community, even in instances where an outsider wants to join in. In response to this, the rest of the community gives up part of their autonomy for the leader because it's expected that in doing so, the leader can ensure their safety and security. You know, the leader's personal home may occupy a particular part of the landscape with choice resources. And if community members behave appropriately in their presence, then they can usually be guaranteed a share of those resources, as opposed to slackers and other misbehaving people who aren't. And likewise, a leader can be rewarded for their guidance by taking a larger share of the resources than everybody else. You know, as if to say, you know, thank you, you've earned it. Now, this all sounds good and fair, but mm. You don't have to look far in the ethnographic record or in our own societies today to see how skewed this relationship can become. Mm -hmm. There's a quite a large body of data showing the dangerous paths that leadership like this can take. Um, I mean, by its very nature, inequality is a result of this form of leadership. You know, that's why sedentary societies are also referred to as non-egalitarian. A society that owns slaves divides labor between demographies and then hoards resources at the expense of their neighbors and sometimes the community itself, that's not an equal one. You know, everybody might have a, a roof over their head and they may be fed, sure, but this distribution of resources and autonomy is unequal because there will always be somebody, a leader, who has the most and there will be somebody, you know, an enslaved person who has very little. Mm -hmm. And this has been one of the biggest challenges facing humans throughout history. You know, what is the ideal way for a society to function, which ensures the fair and equal treatment of its community? Now, of course, depending on who you ask, you know, that answer varies widely across a, a great chasm. Uh, you know, you have anarchy on one end and you got totalitarianism on the other. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, unfortunately we, we don't have the time to go too deep into that discourse. 
um, you know, my only purpose right now is to just kind of give an account of how we got here in the first place. Um, moving on, uh, in direct relation to an upcoming slide, the status of spirituality and faith in a sedentary society is to often make it public. Uh, religion was often a communal practice aided in its flowering by regular rituals and ceremonies. Um, there might be spiritual leaders as well as the group leaders who maintain authority on religious matters and can run ceremonies that provide benefits to the leader. And we'll talk a little bit more about this later. Uh, in terms of kinship, while nomadic foragers usually trace descent bilaterally, so that's uh, through both parents, sedentary foragers typically follow a matrilineal or a patrilineal descent line. And depending on who you were, this was very important. Uh, leaders often arose based on their kinship and their maintenance of power would be sustained through the generations of their particular family lineage. Uh, lastly, with all this talk about you know, resources and food storage, uh, you, you'd think that a prerequisite then for creating sedentary societies was their location within a resource abundant, seasonally predictable locality. Hmm. Um, this was what I mentioned back in episode eight, um, but as tends to happen with this series, as time has gone on and I've been able to read more literature, it actually turns out that there is some slight uncertainty about just how sedentary forager societies emerge. Hmm. So if you like, you can consider this part of the series an update. Uh, for one thing, we do find evidence of sedentism in locations that are not resource rich uh, or have a harsh environment. For another, ethnographic studies seem to indicate that a number of sedentary groups actually struggle to maintain food supplies throughout the year and yet they remain sedentary. Um, so some anthropologists suggest that there are other factors at play that provide the conditions which lead to sedentism. So the aforementioned resource abundance model is just one of these, but there's also the information processing model where sedentism emerges because environmental stressors cause communities to develop hierarchies in order to keep the peace and ensure that knowledge about resources is continuously moving around. Uh, if it happens that these communities cannot split up and move to new places as nomadic bands do, then they'll stay where they are. And their population increases, the groups adapt more to the environment, and so sedentism arises. And now, one of the problems with this model, though, is that you know, we don't really see evidence for this type of knowledge sharing within ethnographically documented groups. Hmm. The more often, there are differences in how information is passed among leaders versus the common people. Um, much of what I have already described regarding the emergence of leadership and social inequality is based upon recent work called the patron-client model. So sedentism emerges because resources are being increasingly stored and protected from others, and leadership arises to process it all. Now, uh, all of these ideas have their proponents and critics, but at the end of the day, the emergence of sedentism brought on a whole new set of challenges to the human communities who lived in them. Mm. And, you know, once that bridge was crossed, sociology would never be the same. Uh, so I wanna highlight three case studies of well-studied sedentary forest societies. Um, but before I do, Albert, do you have anything you would like to add? Uh, not so much, but uh, you know, you really can see kind of the, the seeds of certain aspects of modern society um, in kind of these developments for sure. Oh yeah, it, it, it's it's fascinating to me, really. Um, yeah, let's um let's jump to the next slide now, um, and we're gonna you know we're gonna return to the Japanese archipelago a little mm. bit. Uh, following the first settlement around thirty eight thousand years ago, forager societies began to settle down near a number of woodland and coastal sites, particularly around central Honshu. And by sixteen or fourteen point five thousand years ago, depending a distinct cultural tradition emerged called the Jomon. Uh, the name comes from the Japanese word for cord pattern, which describes how they made their pottery mm. through coiling by hand. Um, they didn't have the potter's wheel. Uh, that's a later invention. Uh, Jomon pottery has been widely studied, and you can see how it developed over time. You got these basic corded forms for cooking meals, to these ever more intricately decorated varieties, used in food serving and storage. 
uh, example of which is seen in the image here at the left. Um, these peoples were among the first in East Asia and thus the world to develop pottery. Um, Jomon settlements had started out small. So at first people resided in coastal cave sites. Then they constructed woodland pit houses within hamlets of about 10 or more to house a number of families. Uh, the construction techniques behind these homes are remarkable. Uh, each foundation was dug just enough to provide additional insulation and the outsides were constructed with large wooden posts aligned with grass thatching. Jomon, keep, Jomon peoples cooked their meals inside their homes, and they actually designed subsurface chimneys by their hearths, so that way smoke could be redirected to the outside of the home. Hmm. Uh, you can see some lovely reconstructions of these types of houses at the bottom right photo here. Eventually, by 8,000 years ago, according to the archaeological record, uh, the hamlets had grown into very large villages, consisting of bigger homes and the definite presence of communal buildings. Um, one of these Jomon communal longhouses is shown in a photo above. Um, these things could reach lengths of like 32 meters or more. Wow. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, th there's also evidence from post holes at different sites that may be evidence of structures with an as yet unknown function. Um, in that very same photo above, uh, they've reconstructed one of these as a sort of multi-layered structure, but to date, we're not exactly sure what these things may have been. You know, maybe they were watching posts, or maybe they were um, ritual to ritual totems, or, or you know, maybe this was a part of a larger structure for storing foods. It's a good question, hmm. but we're not really sure. Um, as the pottery and settlements became more specialized, so did the subsistence practices. Uh, the Jomon initially incorporated a wide range of foods into their diets, both plant and animal, as foragers do. Uh, but as time went on, they began to intensively select certain species. So having originated with a general fishing culture, the Jomon took to deep ocean fishing, hmm. mostly for tuna and related forms. Uh, plant gathering prioritized towards acorns and other fruiting trees. And... There has been quite a bit of discussion about whether the Jomon actually developed horticulture or not. So archaeological sites suggest that these peoples managed wild gardens like the Natufians and purposely managed the growth of particular tree species like the Japanese horse chestnut. While some researchers have argued that these practices were not the same as farming seen in other places where species were domesticated as well as cultivated, there is evidence to suggest that the Jomon sites could be considered an independent origin of agricultural crops because domestication was going on after all. There was a really cool 2011 study that examined Jomon sites and found that at least two species may have undergone domestication. Uh, that's Japanese millet and soybeans uh, because their forms are larger than the wild varieties. And this is a common symptom of plant breeding, you know, bigger is better. Um, so yeah, time will tell if these observations hold up, but if that's the case, then you know, I'd probably be better off talking about this in the next episode, <laughs> this one, but you know, it's all good. Um, yeah. So wh while the Jomon culture had a very long run, I mean, as far as Holocene cultural traditions go, you know, environmental changes, uh, that is a cooling climate around 5,000 years ago, began to cause serious problems. You know, there's evidence that the Jomon settlements were not only being too crowded, but these surrounding landscapes were so overmanaged that foraging practices suffered. Uh, the number of Jomon communities dwindled back to prior levels, people even moving back to the coastlines. Now, estimates vary as to when the Jomon culture actually ended, um, but the introduction of mainland Asian crops into the southern islands around 3,000 years ago has recently been considered the cutoff point, although the expansion of the Yayoi farmers from the Korean peninsula roughly 2,300 years ago, has traditionally been seen as the end date. Um, it's during these times that the standard Japanese culture begins, while the descendants of the Jomon, uh, so a diverse bunch who would include the Ainu of Hokkaido, as well as the Ryukyans, and maybe the Amishi, uh, either integrated into Japanese society or they actively resisted them. Um, and that's a story for another time, of course. Hmm. So uh, let's jump to the next slide now. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about Mesolithic Europe. 
Now, as the Abiolian Alarod period warmed up conditions in the peninsula around 14,000 years ago, groups of foragers from Southwest Asia trickled northwards and admixed with the Ice Age communities. Uh, Genex referred to these descendants as Western European foragers. So this is in contrast with the Eastern European foragers who resided in present day Russia. Uh, they contributed their ancestry to the Yamnaya culture, who we'll talk about in the next episode. Um, and of course, both of these groups, you know, once Scandinavia was deglaciated, traveled north and admixed together. Now, Mesolithic European foragers faced a very different climate from their Paleolithic ancestors. Europe was no longer a land of mostly tundra and steppe, and was transformed into a land of mostly warm, temperate forest, full of birch and hazel and pine trees. Uh, herbaceous plants carpeted the woodland floors, and the faunal composition changed. You know, of course, most of the megafauna died out. You know, mammoths, rhinos, and cave lions are off the menu. Um, and the great herds of reindeer that the Salutrians and the Magdalenians enjoyed had all migrated out of the peninsula, save for Scandinavia. You know, move north where their favorite foods are. So the most common game animals then were now forest adapted species. You know, red deer, roe deer, wild boar, um, bison and auroch, uh, so wild cattle, uh, and you know, as well as a host of small mammals and birds and freshwater fishes. In any case, there was now more food around than there ever was before, mm -hmm. but it was harder to catch with their traditional spears. I mean, trying to get a clean shot while those trees are blocking your aim would never be easy. Right. And that explains perhaps why the bow and arrow technology became very widespread across Europe during the Mesolithic. Hmm. It's a lot easier to shoot a deer with a bow and arrow in the woods than with a spear. And uh, in more places across the region, human populations grew and sedentary settlements developed with astonishing quickness, uh, especially along the coastlines where seabirds and shellfish and marine mammals were being hunted. Uh, Many Mesolithic sites have been unearthed across Europe. Uh, there's Scandinavia, of course, um, and then there's sites like Star Car in England, where large wooden structures have been unearthed, which may or may not be communal dwellings. Um, in fact, the British Isles as a whole seems to have been a very rich place for human communities. Um, of course, uh, early on, it was still connected to the mainland as Doggerland. Then there are the sites around the Baltic Sea, uh, which seems to have been where the first Mesolithic cultures emerged 13,000 years ago. And across the Mediterranean and into the Iberian Peninsula, where we see evidence of intensification of nut and seed collecting. Now, some groups managed to engage in long-distance trade with each other. And they actually built seafaring large dugout boats to send goods across the waters. And a number of new technologies emerged to make food procurement much easier. So we see specialized harpoons and fish hooks, we see nets and traps, and we see antler-pointed bows and spears. And so during the Mesolithic, we see a number of distinctive cultures that emerge across Europe. And they each have their own unique toolkits and subsistence practices. Um, some of the most well-known, just to name off a few, uh, the Azilian of Spain and France, that's 12 to 9,000 years ago. Uh, the Tardinoisian of the greater parts of Western Europe, that's eight to 6,000 years ago and the Swedarian of Poland, so 11 to 8,000 years ago. Now, in general, the Mesolithic in Europe ends when agricultural or Neolithic communities show up. Uh, farming doesn't seem to have emerged independently in Europe, uh, and archaeological evidence, along with genetics, shows that Anatolian agriculturalists introduced the practice over a period of 3,000 years or more. So they began in the Balkans 8.6 thousand years ago, and they traveled all the way across Europe until reaching uh, Scandinavia and the British Isles by 5,500 years ago. And as far as ancient DNA can tell us, Mesolithic foragers do not make up the majority of ancestry of most Europeans today. Uh, as we'll explore more in the next episode, the agricultural communities basically traveled just about everywhere in Europe, and they brought with them their crops and animals and technologies. Mm -hmm. The Mesolithic foragers introduced to all these new changes seem to have taken to them readily. Um, we have what's known as a, a demic diffusion occurring, where admixture was common between two populations, but one ancestry began to prevail over the others. Um, in the end, however, you know uh, uh, this this genetic signature, uh, the genetic signature of the Mesolithic foragers was almost completely swamped in many parts of the peninsula. Um, and studies of ancient DNA among farming communities 
the or early farming communities in Central Europe actually have less forager ancestry than those in the West, including the British Isles. Um, the skeleton, incidentally, shown here on the right, uh, that belongs to a famous individual that's been dubbed the Cheddar Man of the Cheddar Gorge in Somerset, oh, yeah. England. Yeah, he lived over 9,000 years ago during the Mesolithic. Um, and his DNA has been traced in part to some people living in England today. Um, although, curiously, a, a deep look at the ancient genes themselves suggests that you know he would have looked very different from a modern Britain today, <laughs> which is always a fascinating thing to think about. Um, so let's jump to the next slide now for our third and final case study. Hmm. Um, the last group we're going to look at are the Amerindians of the Pacific Northwest of North America, who hold the special distinction of being a sedentary forager tradition that survived hmm. to the present day. Right. Um, though human occupation of the Pacific Northwest had been going on since the end of the last glacial maximum, you know, especially if this was used as a route along the so-called Kelp Highway for the ancestors of these peoples, uh, the classic sedentary cultures we're familiar with today became established by 5,500 years ago or so. Uh, genetic evidence suggests that the peoples here have had a long history in the region, uh, enough to bring about some language diversification. So we have uh, at least six language families that make up the Pacific Northwest, including wow. Nadine, which we previously mentioned, uh, Salishan and Wakashian, among others. Uh, the highest non-agricultural population densities in the Americas were found in the Pacific Northwest, uh, which despite its northern location is kept relatively warm by the flow of the Japanese current. Mm -hmm. Marine resources were highly valued here, especially salmon, which mm -hmm. had been regularly migrating here for at least 5,000 years. And Amerindian nations saw the value of this resource and so took to regular salmon fishing. However, even though the migration cycle was relatively predictable, so uh, the procurement of so many millions of salmon was only allowed for small windows of time. Mm -hmm. So on average, a few two to three week salmon runs over a couple months before the winter. And uh, even then, depending on environmental conditions, salmon numbers could be high or low. So people had to be efficient if they wanted to catch as many salmon as needed to feed everyone. And so we see uh, the development of new technologies like these erected wooden spearing platforms along the rivers, as well as the weirs, which are a kind of dam. Now, archaeology gives us a rough chronology of cultural development for the Pacific Northwest nations. Um, at the start 5,500 years ago, we can see the great transition towards a mostly aquatic based subsistence, as seen in the myriad shell middens at different sites. Um, shellfish collection was a fairly simple exercise. I mean, all you had to do was use a stick to pry them out and then place them in a seaweed-lined basket for mm -hmm. later. Um, the exploitation of these salmon runs, of course, began in earnest. But this huge reliance on fish meat had to be supplemented by whale fat, as well as land-based foods like berries. Uh, so that way you can prevent protein poisoning. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't just eat fish all the time. <laughs> that's, not, that's not good for you. Um, so yeah, food storage practices increased between 3,500 to 3,000 years ago. And this coincides with the emergence of the first large-scale wooden villages. Um, of course, it's by this time that the ills of sedentary living began to appear, including slavery, uh, which has been well-documented in many ethnographies. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, warfare between nations arose later on. Now, thanks to this societal record, uh, as well as the consultation from living indigenous groups, we have a much richer documentation of cultural practices than we do for other sedentary societies, past and present. Um, if you're familiar enough with Native American nations, you might recognize uh, these three iconic elements of Pacific Northwest life. Uh, the two images below showcase ceremonial transformation masks, mm. which were intricately carved and painted to represent ancestral spirits. And they were built to move the jaws and even open up to reveal another face. Um, the use of transformation masks varied from nation to nation and family to family. Uh, then there's the totem pole, which I showed to the right here, mm -hmm. which I must stress is only confined to the Pacific Northwest mm -hmm. nations. I, I couldn't tell you how many pop culture stuff just you know throws a totem pole among any random Native American settlement. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, I remember my um. 
uh, one of my anthropology professors in college, he talked about how he used to love getting those little plastic baggies of cowboys and Indians. Mm. And he got one where they put a totem pole in there. And he's like, and he, even he knew then, like, what the hell is this doing here? <laughs> um, which is always funny. Um, yeah, so yeah, totem poles, which are carved from wood, can mean many things. Sometimes they are family histories with the different figures representing ancestors and clan lineages. Others actually tell stories and legends. Uh, you can read them by following the carvings upward. Um, I know there's one displayed at the Smithsonian uh, Natural History Museum that you can kind of, you go as you, as you go up the stairs, you, you can, it, it tells the story. And you can follow it mm. as you go up. Um, and not all totem poles are vertical freestanding posts like this. Um, incidentally, sometimes they're incorporated into the construction of a house, and sometimes they're built horizontally. Hmm. Uh, and lastly, there's the potlatch ceremony. I remember many long, frustrating months in my theory <laughs> anthropology course going over all the different hypotheses regarding just what the potlatch is all about. Hmm. Because apparently, when early anthropologists interviewed Pacific Northwest peoples about it, and they asked, okay, what is this all about? It had been going on for so long that no one remembered specifically. Wow. Yeah. So uh, in essence, a community leader hosts the potlatch and invites guests from neighboring communities to visit. Once there, there's all sorts of food and ceremony. People literally eat till they vomit. <laughs> and you know, people can do business with each other. So that's when you get all your marriages and funerals and you, know, you name your kids, all this stuff, get all that done. Um, and then just vast quantities of wealthy materials, you know, blankets and things are just passed on to the guests in huge numbers. Um, you, you can call them gifts if you like. Um, I mean, the name potlatch means gift. Um, but there was always an obligation among the invited guests that when they threw their own potlatch later on, well, they'd give their guests gifts of even more wealthy quality. So it's been suggested by many anthropologists that the potlatch ceremony has something to do with rank. It's a way for leaders to show just how wealthy and important they were mm. with respect to everyone else. So you're gloating by throwing a party, basically. Um, but there seem to have been other purposes as well that we don't have to get too deep into for this series. Um, if anything, the potlatch reveals you know a key observation about forager societies. You would never see something like this in a nomadic band. Mm, right. It's one of the ultimate expressions of a sedentary, non-egalitarian lifestyle. Now, the Pacific Northwest societies, as I've said, survive today. They were represented by about 28 nations, including the Klingit, the Kwakwakwaku, or Kwakigul, and the Nuchungul, or the Nootka. They have, like other Amerindians, had to deal with European colonization, mm. uh, you know, regular contact beginning in the late 1700s for the maritime fur trade. And their cultures did suffer some harsh blows. Um, in fact, the Canadian government actually placed a potlatch ban uh, in 1885 that lasted until 1951. Wow. Yeah. Uh, thankfully, today, their heritage and cultural traditions are stronger than ever. Um, I mean, the potlatch ceremony is alive and well, and the art of making transformation masks and totem poles has continued as well. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, uh, many of these nations are working with museums to kind of help recover some of their of their you know stolen items and, and totems. Uh, I know the Field Museum in Chicago; they used to have totem poles displayed in the main hall, mm -hmm. you know, where, where T Rex is and stuff. Um, and th these were collected, you know, many many years ago, but they recently re they recently worked with some Pacific Northwest nations to actually build special totem poles for display in the museum. Wow! And so they're able to return their totem poles back and give them this brand new one that has more relevance mm -hmm. and actually talks a little bit about like the museum story itself. Wow! Interesting. So that's 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 always wonderful to hear. Um. Yeah, uh, Albert, is there anything about these three cultures that you'd like to mention? Well, um, not not too much, but I, I will say that, um, you know, living in Vancouver in Canada, I did see a fair bit of a p Pacific Northwest uh, iconography, um, including, you know, totem poles and these masks. And um, 
definitely, uh, of course, me being me at the time, uh, I definitely was uh, very interested to see how different species of animals are represented in, in this art style. And yeah, it's uh, definitely quite eye-catching for sure. Oh, yeah. Um, there's definitely a, a big appeal among artists, uh, including like non-Pacific Northwest artists right. in, in these styles. Um, like there are classes that you can take, um, if you like, where you are taught this art style um, as part of like a preservation of this, of this cultural mm. tradition. Right. Um, I do know there's the famous case of the Seattle Seahawks and their logo is quokka yudel mask oh, right right that is based on an actual quokka yudel mask uh, uh, for, uh, uh forgive me for not getting like specifics with names and stuff but uh, the team leader found a picture of this mask in a book and was like that looks cool and so they <laughs> made the logo um so it's kind of one of those things where, like you, you you use a native american uh iconography for as a sports logo you know that, that that's a very famous um controversy yeah but in this case, it, it has a happier ending because, you know, that mask belonged to the Quakayoodle and it was lost. This picture, nobody could figure out, you know, where this was, where this mask was. And it took a very long process to, like, track it down. Mm. And eventually this mask was uncovered. And so I know at one of the museums, I think it's the Museum of the American Indian in... Um, uh, um, DC, oh, wow. they had a big ceremony where they unveiled this mask and both the Seattle Seahawks and the Quokka Yudel Nation were there. And they had a big ceremony and they um, they allowed the mask to be displayed for a period of time, I think for like a year or so, before it was eventually returned back to that nation. So uh, it, was, it was all in, in, in good cheer and there was a lot of appreciation, especially by the Quokka Yudel, hmm. that the researchers and the Seattle Seahawks went to, the, to all this trouble to rescue this mask right um, it was like it was like sitting in a in, in a, a museum or or, or a, a closed museum or like somebody's house or something like wow. that and they were catching dust so they were able to like clean it up and, and preserve it for the future hmm. so uh, that, that i've always liked that story i remember learning about that in college and uh, it, it kind of goes to show that you know in the age when we're still dealing with sports nation with uh, sports teams and their continued use of Native American images, often derogatorily for their for their mm. purposes. Right. It doesn't have to be this way. It doesn't have to be like this controversy and, and this this argument on one side. Right. You know, you you can work together and and, and you know actually do some positive change that benefits you know indigenous nations. Um. So yeah, like that. That's certainly that's certainly a whole topic I could get deep into. Mm -hmm. Um. For now, let's just go ahead and jump to the next slide. Yep. And we're going to end this episode on a different note hmm. from sedentism. Uh, because it, it came to my attention that there were a few topics that might be interesting and important to bring up. Um, no two ways of understanding you know, the world have been more important in human history than science and religion. Hmm. These are ubiquitous parts of our lives today. And, you know, how do they come about? Well, regarding science, science is a process by which knowledge is built through experimentation and observation of the natural world. It's a way by which people can find out how and why things work and what causes and underlines the things we see and experience in the world. It's a way of thinking about things. Much of what we think about as modern science, quote unquote, you know, following the scientific method only developed in the last 400 years or so. Hmm. But historical records have been very clear that the process of science has been going on for thousands of years, even with the scientific method. And I mean, if you want, if you want to get technical, you know, we've been using scientific principles since before we were human. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, tool making animals are scientists. You know, a chimpanzee wants to feed on termites, but it faces a problem because they're all hidden away inside their nest. So what to do? Well. Observation comes first. Okay, so the termites enter the nest in these little thin and tiny burrows. Okay, so that seems like the best way to reach them. But your fingers are too big to fit inside. So what would? Well, a stick, maybe? But it would have to be a stick thinner than your fingers, you know, small enough to fit inside the burrows. And so through trial and error, the chimpanzee can try to, you know, stick after stick until one is thin enough to fit inside. And 
what do you know? Termites will bite at the stick and hold on. You, you got you got a ready-made kebab right there. <laughs> and so, yeah, right there is a perfect example of a scientific experiment. Maybe the sort of thing you see published in like science or nature. <laughs> you know, you have all the basic foundations of the scientific method. Yeah. Observation, hypothesis, experiment, results. You know, all of our stone tool technologies from the Lamequian and the Oldowan and through to the Mesolithic and the Neolithic were created through the scientific method. And composite tools like a, a hafted spear or a bow and arrow were the only just the next steps in this tool making process. Um by 100 to 50,000 years ago, archaeological records showcase, you know, human species had developed a number of remarkable products of scientific invention. You know, adhesive materials to aid in the hafting process, ochre pigments that were crushed down and watered for use as paints, nets and ropes for fishing and basket weaving, and on and on. Uh, the rise of sedentary societies following the end of the last glacial maximum provided more opportunities for experiment and invention. I've already discussed the first pottery around 20 to 19,000 years ago from East Asia. And I, I show a fragment of one of these in the photo below. Um, the development of something like a clay pot required the knowledge and control of fire. And that's something that hominids had been using for at least a million years or more. Um, the science of cooking food seems to have been a very gradual prior to the use of pottery. Um, you know, the earliest of which I must again stress were likely used for cooking first. Um, meats and vegetables could be roasted over fires um, or you know, rocks could be superheated and either have food placed on top of them, like in the Tupian societies, or they, you know, they can be thrown into a water-filled basket to create a, a boil, uh, like in some Amerindian nations. Uh, clay, however, seems to have been used by humans first as bricks for building. Hmm. And only later was incorporated in early kitchens to make these kind of molded depressions where you can heat rocks or whatever, um, like bases for cooking. All it would take is for someone's curiosity to put some clay in the fire or even you know some pieces of clay accidentally getting fired and for people to recognize its potential. And so by 20,000 years ago, people took to molding clay into basket-like shapes and heating them over fires for solidification. And then the rest is history from there. Um, it, you know, the fact that pottery seems to have developed independently at least nine times around the world reveals a lot about human ingenuity. Mm -hmm. um, if you like, pottery was one of the first synthetic objects ever made. Mm -hmm. um, one key development that was to radically transform the world of human technology was the development of metallurgy. And this has a, a long and complicated history that incorporated knowledge about chemistry, physics, and engineering. Um, of course, pe people always knew about different metals, you know, copper, gold, tin, silver, lead, uh, meteoric iron. Um, but the beginnings of shaping these minerals into tools only began around 10,000 years ago, uh, where we have evidence from Anatolia that reveals that people were cold hammering copper into chisels, knives, and other tools as well as uh, aesthetic objects. Uh, in the Americas, as we'll see in a moment, the practice of copper cold hammering was also established at a very early date, 9,500 years ago. Uh, smelting copper, so that is to separate the metals from the impurities, that's another matter. You, know, you can't just put copper over a fire and expect it to become workable, like perfectly workable. Um, the temperature of a hearth fire is far too low. It's about 600 degrees Celsius you need at least 700 degrees Celsius to work with copper ores and over 1,080 degrees Celsius for metallic copper itself. Now, these would have been, you know, neat scientific experiments for Holocene peoples, you know, to figure out, okay, how do you, how, how, how can you melt copper to make it like really workable? Um, and the breakthrough eventually came when pottery technology was brought in to make kilns where fires were lit over a pot but then walled into the dirt. You know, with the fire in this enclosed space, more heat could be saved. And so you produce temperatures of over 1200 degrees Celsius, which is you know, just enough to melt copper. And so by 8,000 years ago, smelted copper begins to show up in sites in Southwest Asia and into Europe. And these usher in what are known to archeologists as the Chalcolithic cultures. Now, people began mining and trading copper in both finished and natural farms in 
large numbers. And the practice spread far and wide across Eurasia with agricultural communities. So again, as with pottery, the invention of copper smelting was a global event. It appeared independently at least five times. Hmm. And in due time, the creation of copper and tin alloys, so bronze, and then later iron, developed much later in time. And so outside the scope of this episode. So, yeah, clearly the scientific method lent itself well to the history of technology. But, you know, science is you know about more than just inventing useful things. It also involves observing and understanding the natural world around us. You know, the plants, the animals, the, the weather, the sky. Um, you know, foraging peoples, as indicated by ethnographic studies, are expert naturalists. They need to be, because it was a matter of survival. You know, what organisms are dangerous? What organisms can be used as food? What organisms played key roles in the environment and, and should be controlled and burned or regulated? Um, you know, all these questions and more would have been asked time and time again. And it was up to observation and experiment to figure them out. Um, of course, the process of carving up animal kills or processing plant foods meant that anatomical knowledge was gained. Um, and no doubt when the opportunity arose, human bodies could be explored and understood in life and in death. Um, we've seen how the Neanderthals developed knowledge of medicinal plants to cure ailments, hmm. and practices were used by Homo sapiens as well across the world. Um, one really fascinating instance of medical science, the Aleut of present-day Alaska had understood human anatomy so well that they were performing surgeries that were considered dangerous in contemporary European societies. Wow. So to treat tuberculosis and other related illnesses, they could actually use a fine stone point and like collapse a lung safely. Wow. And then they did stitches with bone needles and seal sinew thread. And yeah, the results spoke for themselves. Um, one aspect of early science that has always fascinated anthropologists and, and me as well um, is astronomy. Forager societies knew the night sky very well and could track it with ease because they had observed that seasonal changes correlated with the changing sky. They could know when the weather was about to get cold or they could know when animals would begin to migrate. And so like they would map out and name the stars. Uh, you know, just imagine how many ancient constellations have been lost in time. Um, not only that, you know, they, they would name parts of the sky too. Um, I know the famous example is uh, some of the uh, Aboriginal Australian nations actually made constellations out of the dark parts of the Milky Way, sp mm. uh, Milky Way span. Um, and, and they would give them names like the Emu, for example. Um, in one controversial instance of research, um, some have suggested that some cave art like Le Chaux in France uh, uh, 17,000 years ago, these might represent star charts. Now, this is certainly an interesting idea. Um, and one piece of evidence used concerns some depictions of aurochs, or bulls, where there sometimes appear a series of six dots, mm. six dots, just above the animal's body. Now, that looks very similar to the constellation of Taurus and the Pleiades star cluster. And so to these researchers, that resemblance is more than coincidental. Um, of course, then it's uh, this is also very highly debated, and uh, <laughs> this is not going to be the last word on this subject. That's for sure. <laughs> um, so yeah, like for millions of years, you know, humans have been scientific animals. You know, toolmakers, doctors, nettlesmiths, biologists, chemists, astronomers. Uh, the process of science today does not belong to you know, a privileged few. It's the birthright of everyone. You know, it, its benefits to humanity should be recognized and shared um what do you think albert i mean i would certainly agree with that sentiment and um this is um this is definitely a perspective that is not often well i mean you know not not always focused on when we discuss kind of human origins in general so um i think it is um it is great to shine a light on it in this way yeah absolutely uh, I definitely think it should be appreciated more, mm -hmm. um, especially if you want to understand, you know, the, the history of, of, you know, thought and invention right, around right. the world. Um, so, yeah, let's jump to the next slide. And uh, you know, just to highlight one of the many prehistoric cultures who 
you know, pioneer scientific advances. Mm. Um, I want to showcase the old copper culture of the North American Great Lakes region. Um, just last month, actually, some exciting news revealed that this chalcolithic culture, you know, once thought to be on the order of 6,000 years old, was actually far older than previously thought. Huh. Hmm. Um, there were new dating techniques that were done. So we now know that the old copper culture emerged 9,500 years ago and lasted until 5,400 years ago. So I was actually able to include it in this <laughs> series right on time. Um, yeah, one of the largest concentrations of native copper on the planet is actually found here. And Amerindian nations realized this and saw value in these metals. Um, they went to great lengths to mine it. They would sometimes dig as far as nine meters, and they would extract the soft copper for use across a wide range. Now, the pottery kiln, you know, much less pottery itself, had not been invented by these peoples. Uh, the oldest pottery in North America, north of Mexico, is around 4,500 years ago, and it came from the southeast. Um, so in order to work the copper, you know, it had to be cold hammered and or annealed. So that is, you either heat it over a fire or you submerge it in freezing cold water just enough to make the copper workable to hammer into a desired safe. Um, it's a very laborious process. Um, but as you can see from the illustrations below, you know, the people of the old copper culture developed quite a number of tools through these processes. Um, there's spear points, there's fish hooks, awls and spatulas and knives and even jewelry. Um, though these practices seem to have had their beneficial uses, <laughs> the cold hammered reality hmm. is that, you know, these copper tools were not significantly harder or even sharper than stone. Hmm. Uh, there have been experimental archaeology studies that demonstrate this, and they reveal that the process of mining and shaping these copper ores was probably more time-consuming than simply napping stone. Hmm. And so by around 5,400 years ago, we see evidence of local climate changes that made the area much drier than the communities were used to. And so the gradual reduction of copper working occurred until this practice all but disappeared from the rock records of North America. Um, out of all these developments, only the use of copper awls, uh, that, uh, which I should mention, those are for piercing skins to make holes. Um, that remained in use uh, because those same experimental studies showed that you know, the awls were more durable than bone for piercing. So a short but interesting chapter in the history of North America, hmm. but no less important, I certainly think. Yeah. Um, so let's jump to the next slide now and uh, turn things around a little bit. Hmm. Um, the origins of religion have proven much trickier to understand. You know, stone tools, pottery, copper mines, these preserve well in the archaeological record. Um, human beliefs <laughs> almost <laughs> never do. Um, you know, on top of that, it's very difficult to define just what religion is. Mm -hmm. And when we offer a definition, we often don't know what to look for. Um, the most common definition given for religion is that it is the belief in the supernatural. So that is outside the natural world and how that is usually experienced by human senses. Um, by that precision, if the ethnographic and historical records tell us, religion seems to have been a near universal phenomena among the human species. Uh, nearly every society that has been studied by anthropologists and others contains elements of supernatural belief. Not necessarily, you know, including gods and pantheons and mythologies or anything like that. Just, just an understanding of there being more to the world than what is typically seen and experienced. Um, one thing that must be made clear, though, is that religion as a distinct thing is not a universal human principle. Hmm. What do I mean by that? Well, a not insignificant number of indigenous or traditional societies actually lack a word for religion in their native languages. You know, even if something is supernatural, it's just another part of life, like air, water, and food. Um, even in the Tanakh, you know, the, the Hebrew Bible, there is no word in the original Hebrew for religion. Hmm. So for some anthropologists, in order to understand the origin of religion, we have to look for more than belief in the supernatural. You know, patterns need to be found that we can confidently link, you know, to so many uh, disparate traditions around the world together. And so once we do that, we can begin to search for clues to these questions we've been looking for. Fortunately, a 2004 study by Candace S. Alcorta and Richard Saucis provided a good checklist for such a thing. They argue for the recognition of 
including belief in the supernatural, and I'm quoting here from the paper, community, communal participation in costly ritual, separation of the sacred and the profane, and importance of adolescence as the life history phase most appropriate for the transmission of religious beliefs and values. So this gives us a lot of information about how religious traditions are preserved and recognized, certainly. Um, you know, th th these are community-wide concepts. They are shared by everyone and passed down from generation to generation through the education of the children. And in regards to that, the transition through puberty is seen as a crucial time for this form of education through ceremony. It was an opportunity for a transformative experience that not only cements oneself into adulthood, but cements their perception of the world around them. Um, important to this distinction is the recognition of the sacred. You know, even though I, I just stated a consistent lack of a word for religion in traditional societies, there are still usually distinctions made in these societies between your typical everyday objects and materials and those that are recognized as or endowed with a sacred essence. Um, I mean, even today, there are many examples of this. Uh, holy books, holy water, uh, monuments, burial sites, certain species of plants and animals, um, and so forth. Um, and this point is an important one, because many anthropologists studying archaeological records or making ethnographies of other cultures often make it a point to identify and describe sacred things. I mean, y'all know the classic joke. If you find an object at a site and it's clearly not used for collecting or processing food or other resources, it's for ritual purposes. <laughs> and, and you know what? Maybe I'm alone in this. To me, that's absolutely fair to speculate about. <laughs> you know, I mean, we just, we, we just don't have the means to clarify whether it's true or not. You know, th these prehistoric cultures are gone. The people who built these cultures have changed dramatically. You know, we, we do not live like our earliest ancestors. So we have nobody to consult about this. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, what can we say about how religion came about and how it evolved over time? Well, one thing that seems clear, at least, is that the well from which religion sprung was the same one that birthed science mm -hmm. and the arts. Curiosity. Yep. You know, mm -hmm. The ultimate curiosity. You know, we are here. We are alive. We can make changes to our world. How and why is this possible? You know, it's not exactly a small question. Everybody asks it, um, and they have learned that it's not exactly a small topic. <laughs> there are some curious observations that have been made about our closest relatives that suggests, perhaps, that the roots of religion run very deep. So the researchers on chimpanzees and other non-human apes that intensified during the 1950s and 60s revealed a lot of fascinating behaviors that had never been studied or appreciated before. Of course, the world-famous Jane Goodall, uh, during her observations of the Gombe chimp populations in 1970, recorded a phenomenon which she called the waterfall dance. Essentially, a troop of chimpanzees came across a large waterfall that particular day as she was studying and this is, in her own words, what she saw when one of the males came towards the water. As the chimpanzee approaches one of these falls, his hair bristles slightly, a sign of a heightened arousal. As he gets closer and the roar of falling water gets louder, his pace quickens, his hair becomes fully erect, and upon reaching the stream, he may perform a magnificent display close to the foot of the falls. Standing upright, he sways rhythmically from foot to foot, stamping in the shallow rushing water, picking up and hurling great rocks. Sometimes he climbs up these slender lines that hang down from the trees high above and swings out into the spray of falling water. This waterfall dance may last for 10 or 15 minutes. After a waterfall display, the performer may sit on a rock, his eyes following the falling water. Hmm. Now, what is remarkable about these observations is that since that time, the waterfall dance has continuously been performed by individual chimpanzees. Mm -hmm. So is this a form of curiosity that borders on awe? Um, well, I mean, if so, could this be considered a ritual with perhaps some form of supernatural significance? Well, Jane Goodall and the others 
have speculated about this ever since. Um, I mean, the question of whether other animals can even have religious beliefs mm. is one that, honestly, I'm not sure we'll ever know for certain. Mm. Mm. Um, of course, the more we learn about animal cultures and cognition, the closer we may get. But for now, speculation is all that we have. You know, clearly, human beings, being religious animals, you know, we acquire this propensity for supernatural belief somewhere. It's just a matter of where. Mm -hmm. um, it is clear, it seems, that the presence and use of language may play a role and a key role at that in the shaping and spread of religious belief, and perhaps was important in its inception. Using language by its nature is a cooperative exercise. You're relying on universally recognized symbols to convey messages and share information with one another. The same types of processes early hominins used for going about their lives, so tool making and its education, aloe parenting, scavenging, gathering, collecting and creating fire, you know, these can be used for communicating meaning with each other. All it could take is one event far outside their field of expertise, you know, a freak storm or a celestial event like an eclipse to just completely transform the community into something new. The very same human imagination used for picturing the end product of stone napping can be used to picture an aspect of nature that isn't seen with the naked eye. You know, once the use of symbolic language emerged, this imagination could be shared with everyone else and discussed. And so a new way of understanding the world can emerge in much the same way that a new technology can emerge. Many anthropologists suspect that religion as we understand it emerged under these circumstances and the presence of strategically placed burial sites um, suggests that perhaps by 400,000 years ago or so, uh, early religion had evolved in the human lineage. Uh, preservation of the dead has often been seen as a sign of religious belief. Um, just for a frame of reference, the Chinchorro culture of Chile and Peru, which I show here, were among the first peoples in the world to mummify their dead around 7,000 years ago, mm -hmm. you know, far earlier than the ancient Egyptians were. Um, but to understand what early religion was like, anthropologists have historically turned to the ethnographic record for clues. Much like it's used in the reconstruction of nomadic and sedentary forager lifeways in prehistory, you know, this is an imperfect method and it does have a lot of flaws, but it at least gives us a framework to work against. So many different belief systems found in historically documented nomadic forager societies have been classified under the name animism. And this uses the same Latin root word as animal or animation. You know, this is the belief that all things in nature have a spiritual essence, you know, that spiritual entities have a constant presence in human life. You know, one aspect of this common throughout nomadic forage of societies is the belief that the spirits of the dead, souls, if you like, can continue to play active roles among the communities of the living. Mm -hmm. In dreams, especially, you know, this is borne out. Not only can spirits visit people in their dreams, but dreaming individuals can themselves exit their bodies and travel places, always making sure to return before morning. Um, sometimes spirits can control the weather, uh, and sometimes spirits can represent the weather itself. And on occasion, these belief systems incorporate deities or gods who hold higher rank above all the other spirits. And they may even be responsible for the creation of the universe and humankind. Um, but these are not necessarily worshipped or even revered. Um, as far as questions of morality are concerned, which do loom large in the subject of religion, uh, nomadic forager belief systems do generally discuss philosophy. Uh, you know, truly poor events, you know, uh, the death of a loved one, a uh, natural disaster, they are considered in the context of what is known as the problem of evil. You know, why do bad things happen to good people? Mm -hmm. And the answer to that, surprisingly... <laughs> at least for a forager, is simple. The world is full of spirits who are not unlike humans, mm -hmm. and so they make human choices. You know, if something bad happened to someone, it's because a bad spirit made it so. Uh, if a spirit or even a god is acting up, people you know, respond like they would to a person who's acting foolish. Mm -hmm. they'll, they'll go as far as to yell out to a god, you know, cut that out. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, what about other moral issues? You know, cheating and stealing and adultery that is often found upon in forager societies. And yeah, it all goes back to our discussion in episode eight. You know, moral issues among the community are not treated in respect to religious principles, 
but rather to their effects on community life. You know, everybody has an agreement about what is the proper way to live in a society. And if somebody is acting up, it's the responsibility of the group to do something about it. And uh, these actions or these negative actions don't necessarily add up to any penalties in the afterlife. Um, you, you don't find things like karma and reincarnation or you know things like heaven and hell in nomadic forager societies um, and their belief systems. You know, because the spirits live in the world like everything else. You know, when you die, your spirit continues to live in that same world, even if your body decays. Now, in other forager societies, and this is particularly sedentary ones, but not always, there may also be a belief system that has been termed shamanism, or the ability of unique individuals to have the power to interact with spirits through altered states of consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, I do need to stress, however, that calling these individuals shamans has recently been questioned. Mm -hmm. um, this name derives from the Evenki, who are a Tungusic-speaking people who live in Siberia. Uh, the name shaman means the one who knows, and it refers to their spiritual leaders. A, a growing number of anthropologists have argued that you know, this sort of expanded historical use of the word beyond Siberia, so to include all manners of spiritual peoples around the world, uh, anything from sorcerers to witches to medicine men, um, is not only inaccurate, but actually disrespectful. Mm. Um, you know, especially since, as a rule, you know, <laughs> if you're indigenous and you live in a traditional society, you know, your religious leaders are called shamans, while these so-called sophisticated industrial societies, they get to have priests and <laughs> clerics and what have you. Right. So, you know, there's that. Um, in this series, I would like to follow suit. And uh, so I'll use the term spiritual leader instead of shaman. Mm. Now, in essence, spiritual leaders hold important roles in communities. You know, they are who you turn to when you're sick or if resources aren't being found like they used to be or if there's a societal problem that somebody else can't figure out. Uh, these individuals contain vast stores of knowledge, and they're able to discuss matters with spirits for additional help. The way to do this involves crossing over onto the spirit's plane of existence, because spirits cannot be seen completely by the naked eye. So hence the emphasis on altered states of consciousness. Mm -hmm. uh, one way to reach the spirit world is for a leader to perform an ecstatic dance. You know, they, they let their body move to a rhythm for sometimes hours on end until they can make a connection. Uh, another way is through special songs or music, like drumming. Uh, some spiritual leaders will forego sleeping or eating. Uh, they'll even harm parts of their body to induce pain. So uh, they'll pierce themselves or they'll mutilate one of their digits. Um, one aspect of this that has historically received a lot of attention by anthropologists, but it turns out is actually not as widespread as once thought, is the use of hallucinogenic drugs oh, yeah. to do the job. Um, you know, you, you'll read up uh, in a lot of old and even newer books. You know, they go on and on about all these ethnographic cases where you know, spiritual leaders eat a certain plant or a fungus and it sets them on a path to a spiritual connection. Mm -hmm. But it actually turns out that these practices are not as old as previously thought. Mm -hmm. uh, many indigenous communities, uh, especially in the Amazon, only took up the use of psychedelics as a result of colonial actions changing cultural traditions mm -hmm. within the last couple hundred years or so. Um, these communities knew about these types of plants, but most of the time they were viewed in a negative context. So like, hey, don't eat that. It'll, it'll mess you up. Um, and when you actually examine the historical record, you find that the use of psychedelics and hallucinogens is actually very rare. Um, one study was like less than 1% of all global cultures use them in this context. Huh. So yeah, um, when you're talking about altered states of consciousness, you know, you, you don't want to think about hallucinogenic plants as far as forager societies are concerned. Now, in a world of spirits, you know, how does somebody like a spiritual leader arise in the first place? Well, it's probably the same way that the leader of a community may have arisen. It's through experience and group recognition. Um, for every spiritual encounter that led to a successful result, you know, a sick person being cured, well, their credibility would only grow among the community. A spiritual leader can manage their higher status in many ways. Sometimes it's as simple as turning it into a business uh, or adding conditions to their magic. You know, they can say like, you know, I'll help you out, but only if you give me the right kind of present. Hmm. Um, and sometimes feats of strength are necessary. Though, funny enough, uh, they don't have to necessarily be legitimate. There was one account of an Inuit spiritual leader 
uh, by the anthropologist Edward Norbeck, who found that you know this leader could impress his community by stabbing himself with a harpoon and bleeding out without dying. Hmm. But what everybody didn't know was that he had actually hid a bladder skin of blood underneath his clothes. So granted, you know, often this form of fraud would be caught and then would be shamed <laughs> mercilessly, as is typical of forger societies. And so like their status as a spiritual leader would actually diminish in favor of somebody else who was more successful and honest. Um, however, you know, these sorts of tricks don't necessarily mean that these particular spiritual leaders are full of themselves. Um, there are legitimate grounds for thinking, you know, it's equally possible that these tricks were important to spiritual leaders in connecting to the spirit. Um, so yeah, as you can see, you know, religious anthropology is an enormous topic and I could continue on for hours and hours if I wanted to. Um, but I do want to emphasize a, a key thing here. The, origin of religious belief, you know, lies on the same stream of human curiosity that science and the arts emerge from. Mm. You know, this curiosity about the world and how it works underlies all of this. And it likely did so for a very long time. Um, I will admit personally, as, as a humanist, you know, I have seen how easy it can be for people in my community to kind of dismiss this aspect of our curiosity in favor of science or the arts. Um, but I mean, the fact that it remains such a universal feature of the human experience means that, I mean, if we want to better understand ourselves, we shouldn't undermine it. Mm -hmm. You know, I personally think that we should honestly celebrate that such a widespread and diverse system of supernatural beliefs has emerged across the entirety of the human species. Mm -hmm. you know, that, that is a testament to our creativity. Um, I guess on that note, uh, Albert, is there anything you want to add on this front? It's... Uh, certainly a very big part of humanity that's for sure and um, I guess the you know, the fact that it it's so difficult to to study um, its origins I guess um, that really just adds to its kind of enigma and um, the importance of you know looking into it and examining it on its own merits oh yeah and um of course, it also plays a huge role in, in understanding the world today. Mm. Uh, I mean, we're, we will talk later about like the, the further changes towards you know the ancestral religions of the world. You know, like where do, where do the big gods come from, for mm. example, and then yeah, like that, that all this stuff is intertwined with with uh, our current situation in the world sphere. Definitely. Yeah. So uh, on the next slide. You know, as with my discussion of science, you know, I do want to highlight a particular topic in the discussion of religion, because it makes a nice, it makes a nice segue into the next episode. Actually, um, one of the most remarkable archaeological sites of the early Holocene is Gobekli Tepe. It's located in southeastern Anatolia. The scale is impressive. It measures 300 meters across, atop an artificial mound 15 meters high. The site consists of a series of large stone pillars shaped like flattened letter T's, and these vary in height from five and a half to seven meters tall and weighing several tons. And they are all surrounded by walls of stone bricks and everything is dug in a semi-subterranean fashion. On the pillars themselves are quite a number of interesting relief carvings. We have various animals, big cats, bulls, pigs, snakes, scorpions, vultures, cranes. Um, and some of these even seem to represent mythological features or mythological creatures with human-like features. Um, in fact, some of the pillars themselves seem to represent humans like as a whole. Like they, they found impressions of arms that are like folded to the chest and, and clothing underneath you know, the tops of these T's, which would have basically been the heads of these people. Um, the interpretations of this site have varied, especially since this is not the only such site of its kind. Um, so Navali Kori, only 32 kilometers away from Gobekli Tepe, and uh, Jerf al Amar in Syria are just two examples that also seem to show a similar construction and figurative artwork. Um, the archaeologist Klaus Schmidt, who was one of the main researchers studying the site before his passing in 2014, argued that Gobekli Tepe and others like it were among the earliest temples ever constructed. Uh, religious sites you know, where communities gathered to perform rituals and ceremonies, the intricacies of which we will never truly know. 
uh, he suggested that since we have no evidence of nearby residential buildings for the temple's builders, Quebec Le Tepe might have been treated as a pilgrimage site that was visited during a particular season by a number of different communities. I mean, certainly the construction of such a monumental sculpture and architecture required the labor of hundreds of people. And what's especially remarkable is that based on the evidence, the people who erected Quebec Le Tepe were foragers and not agricultural peoples who are well known for their megalithic structures like Stonehenge. Um, one of the main plants that grew nearby was acorn wheat, but of an undomesticated variety. So this might have provided the food surpluses needed for the builders, alongside the various game animals like gazelles that lived in the area. It has been strongly suggested that acorn wheat was first domesticated here in Anatolia. Um, we have the genes and we have the archaeology to back that up. So perhaps it's the case that for places like Quebec Le Tepe, the processes and beliefs that led to their construction might have played a role in the development of agriculture in Anatolia. You know, in order to run the rituals and ceremonies for so many people, much less the building of the place, communities devoted more and more time to intensively managing and cultivating the wild fields of wheat, eventually leading to the selection and domestication of, of these plants alongside regular seasonal farming. Um, it's a fascinating hypothesis. Um, of course, it will take much more research to properly analyze. Um, we're not even really sure just how Gobekli Tepe looked in life. You know, was it an open air site like it's shown here? Or, you know, were the pillars and walls covered with a thatched roof? Um, are there any singular sites even related to it? Do they represent a regional religious complex? Um, were the foragers who built these places nomadic or were they sedentary? Um, you know, time will tell, as I always say. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the end, Gobekli Tepe was the shape of things to come. Uh, and I think that's all I have to say for this episode. Uh, Albert, do you have any closing thoughts? Uh, no, not really. Uh, that's a very extensive uh, coverage. Yeah. Mm. Oh, fantastic. Well, yeah, if we go to the next slide, uh, next time on Humanity, a prologue, hmm. we're going to talk about the agricultural revolution and why it was not a thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, recent decades have radically changed our understanding of the birth of farming and the domestication of plants and animals. And it turns out, like so much in human prehistory, it was a complex, gradual process that involved multiple, but not necessarily correlating factors. Um, we'll look at the mechanisms of these processes and then give a global overview of the rise and spread of agricultural communities from Southwest Asia to East Asia, New Guinea, Mesoamerica, Sub-Saharan Africa, and on and on. And we'll continue to explore the further expansion of humanity's range as our ancestors actually settled the greater Pacific Islands, as well as the Canaries, for the first time. Hmm. Uh, lands like these were previously uninhabited, uh, but in many other cases, agricultural communities dramatically overshadowed and transformed neighboring forager populations. Mm -hmm. So we'll explore those movements as well. Um, we'll also look at the unique stepchild of agriculture, pastoralism, mm. and how it developed, uh, often with the aid of a remarkable animal that would go on to shape human history, the horse. Uh, and finally, we'll look at the evidence to tackle that age-old discourse. Was agriculture a blessing or a curse? Mm. <laughs> so all that and more next time. Uh, of course, as always, I'd love to acknowledge our dear friends Henry and Alicia for their contributions to this series. And as always, you can follow us on Twitter for updates at Time and Clades. Um, of course, you're probably watching this on our YouTube page through Time and Clades. You can go there and check out our playlists for our various episodes, including uh, Albert's Bird series and my Human Origins series. Um, if you have any questions for us, please feel free to comment or even shoot us an email, timeandclades at gmail.com. Um, of course, we always look forward to anything that's being received. Um, and of course, if you want to learn more about the rise of sedentism and the world after the Ice Age, you can check our description for the references to this episode. They are, of course, quite extensive. And with that, that is the end of our series. Um, Albert, I do believe we're going to do your show again next week. Is that right? I guess so. Yeah, because we will be recording on the last day of April if that you know, everything goes well. So uh, yeah, we'll continue with my series before we do a news episode again. And uh, so next time we're going to cover some uh, you know, quite obscure bird groups. Um, we're going to look at um, 
mouse birds and kuros and trogons and uh, you know if uh, in many parts of the world especially in you know places like uh, North America and Europe you probably aren't familiar with these birds um, but uh, if you lived 50 million years ago um, and of course there were no humans at the time but if you did uh, you probably would actually be very familiar with them and next time we will uh, tell you why <laughs> so awesome I'm looking forward to it um, yeah fascinating birds until then we thank you all for joining us again and we will see you next time take care